Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome to the University of California Golden State Dairy Management webinar. Uh, today, sounds my house phone. Today, uh, our webinars are being hosted by the uh, ANR Program Support Unit, um, who's going to be running uh, the technical um, aspects of the webinar for us. So, thank you very much to ANR Program Support. Also, thank you to all of our speakers who um, are joining us. Um, for everybody who's who's just joined us, I want to let you know that our presentations today by the speakers are pre-recorded. Uh, yet our speakers are here in the meeting today um, and will be present for a uh, discussion and to answer questions during the question and answer session at the end or se uh, at the end of every session. Um, at any time, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A area. There's a little Q&A button uh, at the bottom of the Zoom screen. At any time, those questions will um, accumulate and then we'll address them at the end of the session. Um, so I want to kick off our, our first session. My name is Nick Clark, by the way. I'm the Agronomy and Nutrient Management Farm Advisor for the University of California Cooperative Extension covering the Southern San Joaquin Valley. Um, and our first session today is Dairy Nutrition. Uh, we're addressing uh, feed costs as they account for approximately 60% of the cost to produce milk um, and how the choice of feeds has the potential impact on uh, environmental footprint. We also hope that you can understand the science behind feed additives um, and how they reduce methane emissions and how far can we go with almond holes and the importance of byproduct feeding. The speakers for today's sessions are Dr. Ed DePeters, uh, professor and dairy nutritionist in the Department of Animal Science at UC Davis, Dr. Ermias Kabrib, a professor uh, of animal science at UC Davis, and Jennifer Heggie, uh, UC Cooperative Extension Dairy Advisor in the Northern San Joaquin Valley. Um, I'm going to copy and paste the bios of our speakers for this session in the chat for you to look at. And uh, I think we can get started with the first presentation by Dr. Ed DePeters. Hello. Today, we're going to talk about almond hulls for lactating dairy cows, feeding amounts, how high can we go, and composition, the impact of sticks and shells. Um, this is a team effort. Um, almonds belong to the family of stone fruits, including peaches and cherries. The almond hull is anatomically similar to the fleshy portion of the peach that we consume. Um, Jennifer Higgy found about three years ago that milk cows in California are fed five pounds of almond hulls per cow daily. So we looked at the availability, the quantity of almond hulls in California, and that's the blue line, and it has increased dramatically in recent years in response to the growth of the almond industry. If we look at the amount of almond hulls consumed by lactating dairy cows at five pounds per cow per day, that's the red line, hasn't changed very much, been fairly stable. So in the future, there's a potential for a surplus of almond hulls. So the objectives of the research were one, evaluate the uh, feeding of high amounts of almond hulls to lactating dairy cows, and two, determine the impact of foreign debris material the shells and sticks on the quality. And quality is chemical composition and adjustability. We're only gonna talk about chemical composition today. The cows at the dairy are trained to eat out of one feed door. So this feed door gives this cow access to her feed manger. She has a red transponder around her neck. Behind this white panel is a circuit board and that allows her to enter this door and get her feed. She cannot enter this door. So lactation study, 12 lactating Holstein cows. The treatments were zero, four, eight, or 12 pounds of almond hulls per cow per day. Uh, we measure production performance, which is milk yield, milk composition, feed intake, and diet digestibility. Here are two cows here eating out of their individual feed mangers. Uh, you can see this cow has a yellow transponder and you can kind of make out the circuit board. She's also fitted with a rumination collar and they're color-coded diets, so I know they're eating different diets. So what was our objective? Our objective was to look at feeding high amounts of almond hulls to lactating dairy cows. The average in California is five pounds and we fed zero, four, eight, and 12 pounds of almond hulls. The TMR composition, when we look at the TMR, the almond hulls went from zero, four, eight, and 12 pounds. As almond hulls increased, the steam flake corn and soy hulls decreased. Almond hulls are a good source of sugar 
that replaced starch from the corn. Almond hulls are a good source of fiber that replaced the fiber from soy hulls. Almond hulls are not a good source of protein, so we had to add soybean meal to the diet. So soybean meal increased, steam flake corn, soy hulls decreased. All other ingredients stayed the same. We looked at variation, and variation from a sense we had one load of almond hulls that we used for the lactation study. So we sampled it four different times. When we look at the mean or the average of that lot of almond hulls, the water-soluble carbohydrates were on average 34.7%. But one sample gave us 31.8, another sample gave us 37.2. When we look at fiber, NDF, the average was 23.5, but one sample gave us 21.9, another one gave us 26.4. The protein was 4.5, it didn't change very much, but protein level was low. But it demonstrates that almond hulls are very difficult to sample to get a chemical composition. The almond hulls that we fed were very high quality. On a crude fiber basis, as is, they were 12.8% crude fiber. California designation uh, by law says that almond hulls have to be 15% or less in crude fiber content. So production summary, there was no difference in feed intake and no difference in milk yield. So if we go back and look at zero, four, eight or 12 pounds of almond hulls, Feed intake or dry matter intake, there was no statistically significant difference in feed intake. There was no difference in actual milk yield. And that's slightly lower here numerically, but statistically, it's not a significant difference. The same occurs for energy corrected milk. Energy corrected milk was not different for zero, four, eight, or 12 pounds of almond hulls. And energy corrected milk just takes into account the volume of the milk as well as the protein and the fat content as far as their energy contribution. There was a difference in milk composition. So milk composition going from zero, four, eight or 12 pounds of almond hulls, the fat test increased, the protein test decreased. I think the reason for this is that the total minutes of rumination per 24 hours increased with almond hulls. So if we look at the zero versus the 12 pounds, at 12 pounds, those cows ruminated or chewed 60 more minutes in a day. That's a significant difference. That I think led to a more stable rumen environment, which contributed to the higher butter fat test of those cows. And also the eating time increased with the amount of almond hulls in the diet. So field weight yields of almonds. When you look at almonds from the field, 50% is the hull, 23% is the nut, 14% is the shell, 13% is debris. And the debris here is called stick. But when we talk about debris in our research, debris is stick and shell. We had 12 sources of commercial almond hulls. We had five that were non pareil and seven that were designated as other. And what we did, which was a lot of fun, we took those commercial almond hulls and we sorted them into pure hulls and sticks and shells. That's debris for us. What we found is for the non pareil 4.7% of the weight was debris, stick and shell. For the other variety, 6.8% of the weight was debris, stick or shell. Where does the stick and shell come from? Well, the harvesting process, the trees, we shake them, the fruit falls to the ground, but also stick and leaf fall to the ground. And then we sweep them uh, on the orchard floor. If we look at the orchard floor, we find the fruit, but we also find stick and leaf material. What the huller is trying to do is separate basically these three fractions, trying to separate the nut from the hull from the stick and shell. But it's really difficult getting all of the stick and shell out of the hull. So we looked at the nonpareil as far as pure versus total. So we looked at the impact of debris. As the debris went down, quality went up. So the pure almond hulls, no stick and shell. They were higher in sugar, they were lower in fiber, and they were higher in energy than the almond hulls that contain the stick and shell. So sticks and shells decrease the sugar and energy content, stick and shells increase the fiber content. The fiber coming from the stick and shell 
or the composition of the stick and shell adds very little to the nutritional value of almond hulls. So we also looked at the composition of almond hulls related to variety. So we looked at non pareil and other. In California, most of the almond varieties are not self-pollinating. So most orchards contain more than one variety. There's three varieties here, and I can tell by the color paint on the trunk of the tree. Um, so when we looked at non pareil they were in higher quality than the other. And the other, for the most part, are considered pollinators. So looking at the non pareil these contain stick and shell. These are commercial almond hulls. The non pareil were higher in sugar content, and they were lower in fiber content than the pollinators or the other varieties. And then remember in our target of having 15% crude fiber or less to be designated as almond hulls, the non pareil on an as-fed basis were 12.7. But when we look at the other, on average, they were 15.9. They would not be designated as almond hulls. So typically in the industry, which you might find is that non pareil and other pollinators are blended so that they can stay below the 15% crude fiber designation. Don't guess test. This is almond hulls from the university dairy. This is from a commercial dairy. The almond hulls at the university dairy, when you look at them, the size of the hulls are large and uniform. They're stick, not too large, and very little shell. But if you look at the commercial dairy, large sticks, there's quite a bit of shell material in there. And you look at the hulls, they vary in size from large to small. Variation for almond hulls. We looked at the California Department of Food data from 2014 to 2018, a five-year period. And these data are from samples of almond hulls collected by the CDFA inspectors. What we found is that over the five-year period, on average, 50% of the almond hull samples collected by inspectors were in violations. The samples that were in violation were 17% crude fiber. Remember, the designation says they are going to be 15% or less to be called almond hulls. When we look at the ones that were legal, 13% crude fiber. So take home messages, almond hulls of high quality can be fed at high amounts to lactating dairy cows. Composition. The composition of almond hulls varies greatly. Test the composition of your almond hulls. Don't guess, always test. And almond hulls of high quality are an excellent source of readily available carbohydrates, sugar, and digestible fiber for lactating dairy cows. So thank you to the Golden State Dairy Management Committee, the Almond Board of California, and the Biomass Work Group. And if there's any questions, I can answer those later. Thank you very much. My name is Jeremy Escarab. I'm a professor at the University of California, Davis. I'll be talking about uh, a current science of feed additives to reduce enteric methane emissions. So just to set the scene, um, globally about 14 and percent of uh, greenhouse gas emissions come from livestock. If you take out the 1.5% from the land use, then you have about 30% from agricultural production. And uh, from that, about 35% of emissions come from um, ruminants and enteric fermentation so in, in, in the form of uh, methane. So that's why there is a lot of interest and a lot of work that's been going on right now to try to reduce um, methane emissions, particularly from uh, ruminants. So there, there, has, there have been a, a number of uh, uh, feed additives and can sort of classify them into two main groups of feed, feed additives to reduce methane emissions. Uh, those include inhibitors. Uh, inhibitors are things like seaweed or, or, or bovire or, or, or threonopy. And uh, there are another group uh, called the gut modifiers in, in general. And basically they work by modifying the rumen environment uh, so that it reduces methane emissions. This could be through uh, things like uh, plant bioactive compounds. So there are plants that uh, produce uh, compounds mostly for defense, for, for their defense, such as tannins or essential oils, which have proven to reduce um, uh, methane emissions. And there are also others that uh, would compete with um, methanogens for hydrogen, such as nitrates. So they are alternative hydrogen forms and reduce methane emissions uh, uh, that way. There's also a class of feed additives that work by modifying the feed composition. 
for example, synthetic amino acids, uh, phytases, and proteases. Uh, but this uh, group of uh, feed additives basically improve the feed efficiency uh, of the animal, and so indirectly it reduces the, 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 the methane intensity uh, associated with uh, livestock production. So those, those third class we're not going to be talking today, but we're focusing on the inhibitors and, and the gut modifiers. So starting with the, with the first one, which is the, the, the seaweed. So the story of the seaweed started with this farmer in, in Canada, um, observing that the cows that were foraging on, on seaweed, this was in, in the eastern part of Canada, um, they, they seem to do better than, than other cows. So he contacted a, a scientist. And, and so the scientists, they screened a number of different seaweed to see what kind, of, uh, what kind of compounds they have and what kind of activity they have as well. And what they found out was that um, a, a particular species uh, called Asparagopsis taxiformis had an anti-methanogenic property. And they've seen that it reduces methane emissions but quite, quite substantially uh, in the lab. Uh, quite luckily, we were able to obtain a, a sample of this uh, seaweed, and we, we did the, try the same thing in Davis as well in the lab, and we saw that uh, we were able to, do, to replicate what they've done. And so we want to move in into, uh, move on into a, a in vivo trial using real animals. And, and so we, we were able to, to get enough of, this, uh, uh, of the seaweed and, and conducted a, a trial using dairy cattle. And for the dairy cattle, we gave them two doses. One is half a percent of their uh, feed intake, and the other one is 1% of their uh, feed intake. So this being the first ever trial in dairy, we weren't sure uh, what, how much we, we need to supplement them. Um, so the results of this work showed that uh, there was a substantial reduction in emissions, up to 67% reduction in, in methane emissions, uh, those supplemented up to 1%. Uh, there was a, a little bit of drop in dry matter intake, um, but, but because of some palatability issue, but in this case, the animals were given quite high amount of, uh, relatively high amount of seaweed, uh, but the, the uh, indication was that this seaweed does work and it reduces methane emissions uh, substantially. So we proceeded to have another uh, study where we wanted to answer the question where, how long does it uh, last the effect? Because uh, we did this for about two weeks, but for, for beef cattle, we want to do it for about uh, 21 weeks or so. Um, and then also see if there's an impact on uh, the type of feed they are, they are given as well. So we did the second follow-up uh, experiment in, in beef cattle. And we have two doses in this case. Uh, we, we are using a better quality seaweed. So we reduced the, the uh, dosage to 0.25% and 0.5%. So it's about um, 50 grams or about 25 to 50 grams per day per, per, per animal. Uh, so the control animals, they basically behave as the way we expect them. Uh, as, you, as you change the diet, so in the first day we're in a starter diet, high forage diet, then they went to a, a medium uh, forage diet and then to low forage diet. And as, as we expect that it, the, the methane emissions would reduce. So this is in the control with no supplement at all. So this is what we expect as you change the, 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 the diet. And, and then when we uh, supplemented with 0.25%, uh, we saw a substantial reduction in every part um, of their life cycle. So the, during the high forage and the low forage, in both cases, we saw a, a substantial reduction in, in, in emissions. And then when we increased the dosage, we also saw an increased reduction in methane emissions as well. So in, in some cases, it was actually went down all the way up to 80% reduction. So the next um, feed additive that I want to talk about is a free NLP or bovire, which was uh, uh, put together or developed by DSM in, in, in Europe. And uh, so some of the experiments uh, associated with that is that there's quite a, a, substantial, a substantial reduction. So you can see that when you do uh, the three levels, in this case, the three levels of three NLP. So in all levels, there was a substantial reduction in, in uh, methane emissions. And through a meta-analysis, we were actually able to, to show that uh, three NLP above IR reduces uh, emissions by up to 40% in uh, dairy cattle and about uh, to, to 20 to 25% in, in, in beef cattle. So moving on to the second category, which is the uh, um, gut modifiers. 
Um, plant bioactive compounds such as tannins and saponins have, have shown a good promise in reducing methane emissions. Uh, one in particular, grape pomace, which is readily available in California, it contains uh, tannins and, and um, uh, this, this could reduce the emissions. There was a study done in Australia that have uh, looked at uh, dried and ensiled uh, grape pomace. And what they found was that in both cases, there was a substantial reduction in methane emissions. And in, in, in the case of uh, 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 dried um, grape pomace, the, the, the milk production actually increased. So in the ensiled pomace, there was a, a reduction of in milk yield, but in dried one, there was actually an increase in, uh, in milk yield. So it's a, a win-win situation where you increase the milk yield and, and improve or reduce uh, methane emissions as well. The, 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 the second uh, plant bioactive that I want to talk about is, is mutrol, and this is mutrol is based on garlic and citrus extracts. And when we use them at a dose of about 15 grams per day, we saw a, re a reduction of 23% over, over 12 weeks. So this is a work also we've done in, here in California and using um, the typical California diets, and we've seen a, a substantial reduction in emissions as well. Ionophores could be uh, another way to reduce emissions, um, particularly monensine is extensively used in the US of, uh, for beef and, and dairy cattle. Um, and we've seen a reduction of about 10, 13 percent uh, using that. But the, the only thing is that um, it works for about six weeks or so. And then the, the, the human microbes, they adopt to the remote environment. And therefore, you don't see any more reductions in uh, emissions. Uh, nitrates are uh, another group of uh, feed additives that uh, substantially reduce uh, emissions. We've seen a, a decrease in about 16 percent or so in, in methane production. Um, there's no change in milk yield or, or uh, energy retention. Um, so that's, that, that, that's the, the, the good news. Uh, the only challenge with nitrate is that if you feed them in greater amounts, then there will be a greater methemoglobin levels, which is toxic to animals. So we don't really want to get to that. And so the, there are a couple of ways of preventing that. One is to try to adjust the animals slowly, which is going to be a bit difficult in a commercial setting. And But the other one is there's some studies that's been going on right now in which they are identifying some bacteria that is able to feed on nitrite. So um, when nitrate is converted into nitrite, and so this bacteria can feed on, on nitrite, which means that it will reduce the methemoglobin levels and will be able to feed uh, nitrate quite uh, safely. So in conclusion, there are several solutions that have been developed. There are a number of uh, feed additives that are in development right now. Uh, there's a number of uh, studies ongoing at the moment, and we hope that some of them will be part of the solution. So in the next year, so in the next five years, uh, I'm sure that we will have uh, feed additives or combination of feed additives that will, uh, will reduce uh, enteric emissions by 30 to 50 percent. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hagee, and I am the Dairy Advisor with UC Cooperative Extension serving Merced, Stanislaus, and San Joaquin counties. Today, I'm going to talk about a management survey we conducted as part of a larger study looking at the practice of feeding byproducts on California dairies. The survey consisted of management practice questions as well as questions to quantify byproduct usage on dairies. Producers received the hard copy survey an invitation letter explaining the project, and then a pre-addressed and stamped envelope for easy return. The first 100 surveys uh, that were completed received a $10 Starbucks gift card for their trouble. Uh, 156 dairies responded to the survey, which translates to a 13% response rate. Of the 156 dairies that responded, 18 dairies, or 11.5%, did not feed byproducts. They represented a small number of milk cows, just over 6,000 cows for the 15 dairies that supplied information on herd size. 11 of those 18 dairies that did not feed byproducts were located on the coast or in Northern California. These dairies were smaller than state average, ranging from 70 to 600 lactating cows and averaging 200, 279 lactating cows per dairy. Two dairies did not provide location information, and the remaining five dairies that did not feed byproducts were located in the San Joaquin Valley. 
three in Merced County, one in San Joaquin County, and one in Kings County. These dairies were larger than their coastal and Northern California counterparts, ranging from 400 to 1,200 lactating cows, but on average also smaller than a typical California dairy at 690 lactating cows per dairy. 138 of the 156 responding dairies fed byproducts, about 88.5% of responding dairies. These dairies represented just over 195,000 lactating cows with an average herd size of just under 1,500 cows per dairy. 109 of these dairies, roughly 80%, were located in the San Joaquin Valley. This slide is a breakdown of return survey numbers for the San Joaquin Valley, the number being survey returned for that county. These correspond to the breakdown of where dairies are in the state pretty well, but also where we have UC coverage that might convince a producer to answer a survey. Tulare County returned 26 surveys, followed by Stanislaus with 25 and Merced County with 19. Of the dairies feeding byproducts, 70% were Holstein herds, a handful were Jersey herds, and the remaining herds were mixed Holstein and Jersey breeds, other breeds, or crossbred herds. We wanted to get an idea of how byproduct feeds were managed on dairies. So along with the demographic information, the first page included a series of questions related to byproduct management. The following slides are questions we asked, which all appear exactly how they did on the mailed survey. The first question was, do you or your nutritionist send samples of byproduct feeds to a commercial lab for nutrient analysis? From the graph here, 75% of dairies reported sending samples to commercial labs for nutrient analysis, 22% did not analyze samples for nutrients, and the remaining 3% were not sure. And I do need to add that um, 138 responses were recorded, so of everyone returning a survey, 138 um, producers answered this specific question. A follow-up question, if samples were analyzed, how often? Options included on arrival only, monthly, quarterly, when a problem arises, or folks had a write-in option. The majority reported sending samples when a problem arises, about 47%, while monthly and quarterly sample analysis were also popular options at around 17 and 16%. 9% selected both quarterly and when a problem arises, and the remaining responses were a handful of on arrival only and write in options. Um, and on this one, 103 responses were recorded to this question. If you don't analyze a particular byproduct, how do you estimate feeding value? We asked folks to select all options that applied. On this one, 123 responses were recorded for this question. Since it is select all that apply, multiple options were selected and the percentages add up to more than 100%. 80% utilized a nutritionist to determine the values. 80 of the 123 responses or 65% only selected the nutritionist option, by far the most popular option. Uh, most people are relying on their nutritionist for byproduct values, which is probably not news to anyone. Uh, only one dairy producer reported other, and that write-in answer was trial and error. Next, we asked about concerns when feeding byproducts. Again, this is select all that apply. So the numbers are going to add up to more than 100%. 100 133 dairies answered this question and the responses are presented in descending order with availability being a concern with most dairies. 82% of respondents indicated availability as their concern. 69% were concerned with quality of the material delivered, 50% with variability in load quality, and just under 50% were concerned with molds, yeasts, and other undesirable products. Pages two and three of the survey pertain to specific byproducts being fed. These pages included a list of potential byproducts in alphabetical order, columns to designate which groups of animals received the byproduct in their ration, 
and another column to report tonnage of the specific byproduct purchased in 2018. You can see the example of almond holes provided in the first row. There were also spaces provided for write-in options for anything we missed in our preloaded list. This graph depicts the 10 most commonly fed byproducts in California for 2018. This doesn't take into consideration the amount fed, just how many dairies fed a particular byproduct. You can see the byproducts listed at the bottom of the graph and the bar representing how many dairies fed that particular byproduct. Almond holes were the most commonly fed byproduct on California dairies, reported by 112 of the 138 dairies. Holes were followed by whole cotton seed with 95 responses and dried distillers grains or DDG uh, with 76 responses. Canola pellets and meal both made the top 10 independently with 70 and 42 responses. Corn gluten feed, wheat straw, molasses, liquid whey, and soybean meal rounded out the top 10. Responding dairies fed 58 unique byproducts in 2018. The survey results to demonstrate the valuable service the dairy industry provides other ag industries through purchase of byproduct feeds, thus creating revenue streams for these other industries, as well as repurposing a product that has little use or value otherwise into human edible protein in the form of meat and milk. So what else uh, did you do with this data? You're probably wondering. Uh, this presentation covered just the benchmarking or background information of the byproduct study. Uh, Jim Fatal with the Department of Animal Science at UC Davis formulated rations with and without byproducts, uh, while Dan Sumner also at UC Davis um, and his group were tasked with taking that data and assigning economic and environmental costs and benefits to the practice of feeding byproducts. They're looking at this from the perspective of the California dairy industry, the source industries of the byproducts, as well as California as a whole. There should be more information out on those components of the study soon. Before I end, I'd like to thank the dairy producers that answered the survey. Your time and collaboration are greatly appreciated, as always. And I'd also like to thank the California Dairy Research Foundation for funding this project. Um, now I'd like to also acknowledge the project team, especially Ed DePeters, for helping me to develop the survey that we sent out to the dairy producers. Uh, last slide, here is my contact information. Please feel free to reach out with any questions or comments, or if you have any ideas for more work that needs to be done regarding byproduct feeding. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you for attending, and I look forward to chatting with everyone in the question and answer session in just a few minutes. question from Stephen Kafka is, uh, is to Dr. DePeters. Uh, could the almond hole providers create a higher and more consistent feed product if there were a demand? or is it too difficult? As far as the almond hull quality, I think the, the industry is definitely trying to improve the quality as far as the, the hauling practices. And I think some of the issue comes up with uh, the age of the trees. And so the age of the trees could impact the proportion of sticks that are in the almond hulls. And when you look at the pruning methods, the pruning methods have changed over time as well. So there's less pruning in the orchards and I think that contributes to um, more sticks. The difficulty part will always be the, the quality aspects and getting paid for it. So for the industry, uh, the dairy industry, you know, has to be willing to pay for the higher quality. And I think once they realize that the almond hulls, uh, there are important components in the diet, and when you have sticks and shells or you have components that aren't known, that affects the, the ration as far as the protein and energy content. So when you're formulating diets, you don't like to have unknowns and you don't want to have a lot of variability there. I'm not sure, Steve, if that answered your question, but. Well, here's, here's a, uh, uh, another question that might add some, some clarity. Um, uh, for Dr. DePeters, what, what is your definition for high quality almond holes? And also there's a thank you for your presentation. That's a great question. Um, I think the, I know the standard for California is 15% crude fiber. 
what we fed in the lactation trial was closer to 13% crude fiber on an as-is basis. And if you saw the samples, remember from the violation study, those samples that were not in violation were 13% crude fiber on an as-is basis. So I think for me, quality is you know, getting down to about 13% crude fiber on an as-is basis if I'm gonna be feeding them to um, lactating dairy cows. And one thing that we've also talked about, and Jennifer Hagen and I have talked about it, is using almond hulls as a forage ingredient. We used almond hulls as a concentrate ingredient. So we were adding them as a concentrate component. But I think based on the rumination data that we saw, the stimulation and uh, chewing time, that we can also think about potentially using the almond hulls as a forage. So in a situation in California this year where water is going to be short, the issues of corn silage and cereal silage, there may be a potential to use the almond hulls as a forage component to replace some of the corn silage and cereal silage in the diet. So the quality, you know, I think is important. Sticks and shells don't add very much value and you're also paying for it on an economic basis. And so for a dairy producer, you know, why would you wanna buy something uh, that is not of quality? You test alfalfa hay and you wouldn't buy uh, 54 alfalfa TDN hay and pay a $56 TDN price. And that should be the same with almond hulls. You know, quality is important for the cows in milk production. Thank you, Dr. DePeters. And we, uh, I'll, I'll read this question uh, from uh, Lan to uh, Dr. Kabrib. Uh, what is the desirable nutritional profile of plant-based feeding products that can result in minimal greenhouse gas emissions uh, in cows? Thank you, Lan, for your uh, question. Um, we'll forward that question along to uh, Dr. Kabrib and make sure that uh, we include those answers in the post-meeting follow-up um, that you all will uh, receive via email. Um, we still have some time, so people continue to throw your uh, questions in the question and answer or the chat. We're monitoring both. Um, I've got a, a question for uh, Dr. DePeters um, uh, regarding uh, the economics of, of almond holes. Uh, and, and future research of, of feeding almond holes on dairies. Some of the uh, uh, producers that I've spoken to in the Southern San Joaquin Valley, uh, you know, talk about uh, space on the facility as an important resource for, for stocking feed and uh, sometimes there are limits in you know, how many holes they can, they can buy in order to mix into the, the ration and uh, price varies. So I'm wondering, is there any uh, uh, future uh, 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 work that you're aware of that looks at the economics of um, feeding almond holes in California? Sorry about that. I shut off. <laughs> I, I don't know. We didn't look at the economics, um, but I think that's important. And even when you look at the fact that um, our milk production did not change statistically significantly, but there was a little bit of a drop in numerically in the milk production. So I think that's something that would be important for the producer because that's a dollar return. So economically, no. Right now, there's nothing that I know of looking at it. As far as space on a dairy, I'll tell you, we tried pelleting on almond hulls because the almond hulls are being used in our study as a concentrate ingredient. And so we did pellet almond hulls here to try to do it and convince the almond board to maybe look at pelleting almond hulls as a, a way to use it as a feedstuff within a, within a dairy setting. But the pelleting will add cost to the product. And I think the cost in the product, um, you know, it's gonna be kind of variable depending on the industry, but no. Right now, the economic one would be a great one to do. And that's one I think would be better with someone like Jennifer Hagee where she could do it through the survey to get input from the nutrition consultants because they're the ones that are comparing the different byproduct feedstuffs to be used in a ration. Thank you. Um, here's a question for Jennifer. Um, 
what effect do you think drought has for a, a byproduct use and, and which ingredients are likely to be uh, used more or less? All right, thanks, Nick. Um, so just as Ed said, I mean, I think obviously when we're talking drought in California, we, we grow our own forages. So they're gonna be byproducts um, that we can feed in place of forages when, when we need to, or at least to supplement in, in place of some forage. Um, so I think, I mean, almond holes is a, is a, I think, you know, rises to the top of that list pretty quickly. Um, so I think, you know, Ed's, Ed's work on, on these increased rates are going to come in handy this summer when, when water allotments are going to be down and, you know, folks are trying to figure out, you know, do I plant corn, do I plant sorghum and, and, you know, can I even plant all my acreage? So, um, and, you know, almond holes are, are local. We have them here in California. So I think that's a logical, uh. And I did get a, a question in the uh, uh, chat from JP asking if uh, slides will be available. I think traditionally uh, with this conference, we've made slides available post uh, conference. I believe that's our intention still, correct, Jennifer? I believe so, yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Lisa Lieberman with uh, uh, Cal Agalert. Um, uh, it, looks like a bit of a comment question. Uh, if growers don't benefit economically from adding almond holes, why would growers want to use them? Rhetorical question? I think they wouldn't. I think that's a safe guess. Okay. Well, we still have, a, we still have about five more minutes for anybody that wants to ask any, uh, any questions. And then remember, um, any any questions you have for uh, uh, Dr. Kabrib, we're certainly recording them and passing them along to him uh, real time. So um, since he's not able to be here with us today, unfortunately, you won't get those answers right away. But our intention certainly is to include his responses to your questions. So uh, uh, don't be shy and don't um, uh, hesitate to uh, send a question for Dr. Kabrib as well. Uh, okay, I see another question that came in for Dr. Kabrib. Has there been any studies uh, of uh, negative using seaweed long term for dairy cows in order to decrease uh, emissions? Great question. I like to read these aloud, even though uh, uh, Ermius is not. Uh, thank you, Camille. Have there been any studies of negative effects? of using seaweed long-term for dairy cows in order to decrease emissions. Um, I, I know I'm speaking to a non-person, but I want to uh, ask these questions aloud. Hopefully they'll, they'll spark some other questions from, uh, uh, from the group and I want you all to hear them. So thank you, Camille, for, for asking your question. We'll make sure that that uh, comes through. Uh, Ed or Jennifer, perhaps one of you has an answer to uh, that question. I don't have an answer to it, but I think it's a great question. I, I think when you look at, you know, the studies, I don't care whether it's the almond health study or the seaweed trial, when you're doing three or four week periods with the diets, those are sometimes difficult to extrapolate to long term. Um, you know, some of the products that are used to uh, mitigate methane emissions, um, some of them have dropped feed intake, have dropped dry matter intake. And so if dry matter intake decreases, then, you know, as a nutritionist, you're always thinking about, you know, long-term effects because body condition of the cows and those cows are trying to be rebred, you're breeding those cows. You have to think about that. And that's why we probably need to do a few more in some of the cases, long-term studies, especially when you see decreases in uh, feed intake, changes in feed intake. Those to me always send a signal that What's going to happen long term? Is that just a short term effect that the rumen conditions change and then the cows come back and there's no difference in feed intake? Or is that feed intake stay depressed so that um, energy intake is low and that affects their body condition and that could have effects down the road as far as on reproduction as well as immune function? Because immune function is 
driven by protein and energy? But that's a really, that's a really good question uh, because a lot of times our studies you know, are not done at the university long-term. More typically those are done in field trials when you can add it to a diet in a field study and then follow it there. Just more difficult because you don't follow maybe the individual animal as far as feed intake, you can follow them with milk production because the DHI records. It's a little more difficult because you're doing pen, pen averages for feed intake. But I think that's where field trials really have a benefit is that you can do the long-term impact on, on the animals. Hey, we have a, a question. Um, could nitrates be used strategically to reduce uh, methane emissions? This is on nitrate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the nitrate one, Dr. Um, Dr. Brea did a good job. You know, the nitrate, the nitrate in the rumen, nitrate itself is not a problem per se. It gets reduced pretty quickly to nitrite. The nitrite going to ammonia in the rumen, that's a slow reaction. And that's where the problem is. And I think that's where he mentioned that they're trying to find microbes that will take that nitrate and reduce it to ammonia. And then the ammonia will be used by the rumen microbes to make microbial protein. Normally what happens, but when you get high levels of nitrate, that reaction going from nitrate, from nitrite, excuse me, to ammonia is slow. So that's the tricky part. And adapting cows on a dairy, that's hard because when the cows come from the transition and they go from the dry cow pen to the lactation strain, you don't have a lot of time to uh, adapt the rumen of all those cows on a, on a commercial dairy. And doing the microbes, I think makes sense. It just, again, they have to compete in the rumen. And that's, a, I always tell the students in class, that's a very harsh competitive environment. And there's been very few studies that have shown that you can add a microbe to the rumen and it survives. I think one of the best examples is when they did Monensin in Australia, there was a bug that could use that toxic amino acid. But nitrite, nitrate, I think has potential. It's just that nitrite causes the hemoglobin and that's the, that's the issue when nitrite gets absorbed. Um, and I think we have time for maybe, thank you. We have time for maybe one more question. We've got a little bit of a late start and we're nearing the end of our, our session. Um, but, you know, dairy producers are looking for, um, you know, new ways to reduce their, their methane footprint. And we have a question from uh, uh, Lisa with Ag Alert. Um, are there more government regulations coming uh, out that will compel growers to reduce their methane emissions? Well, I don't know about new, but we're, we're currently under, um, what is it, Senate Bill 1383, I think, which is to reduce methane emissions by, by 40%, I think, by 2030. So, I mean, I don't know if anything else is coming down the pipe, but we, we are in the middle of, of um, efforts to reduce methane emissions on dairies in California. Um, that's the 1383 is very specific to manure methane emissions, enteric emission reductions are not required at this point, and we have no regulatory requirement in either California or the US for that. However, producers definitely want to reduce their emissions where they can. Okay, thank you again to um, all of our uh, attendees, the, the great questions that you've all asked and we'll stay committed to making sure that uh, Ermes' uh, questions are answered and, and those responses are sent back to you all as a follow-up. Thank you to our uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Ed Peters and Jennifer Heggie. And this uh, concludes our, our dairy nutrition session. And uh, we're looking forward to joining you all um, just seven minutes for our uh, for our next session. Thank you.
Okay, we're just about ready to start up again. We can ring the old cowbell. Good afternoon and welcome to session two of the University of California Golden State Dairy Management webinars this year. I'm Deanne Meyer. I serve as Livestock Waste Management Specialist for UC and I'll be moderating this session. Um, I'll quickly review our process. Find the right screen in front of me. Uh, the event is recorded for educational purposes and we will um, use part of that perhaps for promotion as well. We're in the webinar mode, so folks are muted uh, and you'll be without video throughout the whole session. If you have questions for our speakers, please put those in the Q&A section. It's at the bottom of your screen and you can click on that and type it in and that'll make it easier for us to monitor. Uh, questions will be answered at the end of the third presentation in this session. Please feel free to use the chat function of Zoom uh, for non-questions or conversations or comments you might wanna make, uh, and that'll help us keep things straight. If you want it to go to just the panelists, you have the ability to change the to field in that chat function, or it can go to the panelists as well as all the attendees. We can move to the next slide. Uh, we do have one continuing education unit for folks who are a member of ARPUS credit for this particular session with a total of four units available if you're with us for the entire afternoon. Um, with that, we're gonna head into our session. We have three fabulous speakers today and I'll put each of their bios in the chat box for you if you wanna uh, contact them later, make it easier for you. Uh, and we'll start off with um, conversation about um, polled cattle, genetically polled cattle, and then we'll have a conversation about uh, how much milk do calves really need because our calves are so important and calf management and antibiotic management are key on dairies. And the last will be to treat or not to treat, what and why. So with that, let's head to Dr. Allison Van Eenenem and our first presentation. Alison Van Eenenum, and I'm a Cooperative Extension Specialist in the Department of Animal Science at UC Davis. And I'm going to be speaking to you today about polled genetics. As you may know, some cows, particularly dairy cows, grow horns and some don't. And the reason for this is that they differ genetically. And just a little primer on genomics, you may recall from high school that the bovine genome or all genomes are made up of the building blocks of base pairs and in the bovine genome there's about 3 billion of these A's and C's and T's and G's that collectively form genes which make proteins. And one of these genes is known as the Paul gene. That is the gene that's responsible for whether cows grow horns or don't grow horns. And there's naturally occurring genetic variations that exist between breeds. Many dairy cattle have horns which is recessive to the dominant trait of not growing horns, which we see, for example, in Angus. And what happened is a naturally occurring um, alteration happened such that 212 base pairs replaced 10 base pairs. And this results in not growing horns. This occurred naturally. And this again is a dominant trait. So if you get one copy of this um, form of the gene from either your mum or your dad, then you won't grow horns. And so we don't ever see a situation like that. You're either pole or you grow horns. And again, horns is recessive. And you may know that um, when we look at dairy cattle, uh, there are some naturally occurring uh, pole dairy cows, but in general, the average genetic merit of the polled animals, and so here you can see the homozygous big P, big P, meaning it's dominant, on average, their genetic merit, be it Jersey or Holstein, is about $150 less than the horned varieties of, of um, Holsteins. And this was work that was done by my graduate student, Macy Mueller, back in 2018. Um, and so generally, producers don't like to use polled animals because you have this big drag on genetic merit. And just to see if this was still relevant, um, I looked at the uh, Select Sire catalog recently and had a look at the top 30 Holsteins. And here you can see their range in uh, net merit 
is between 819 and 916, average about $841. That's their top Holsteins that are all horned. And if I compare that to the 30 polled Holsteins that I could find in their catalogue, and these are homozygous, um, not growing horns or poll, then you can see that the average merit is considerably lower. The average is about 549 versus um, what we see for the, the horned animals. And so there's still this um, deterrent from using poll genetics because it, you have such a big hit in the net merit um, of those animals. And so what I'm going to talk about today is, well, would it be possible to actually go in there and introduce this useful genetic trait of not growing horns into elite dairy cattle germplasm? Um, and I'm going to talk about a technology called genome editing. Uh, and what we do is introduce editing reagents that go in and make that same alteration that we see in the, in the Angus breed, specifically at the pole gene of the of the um, dairy breed, such that you wouldn't alter anything about else about their genetics. They'd still be the top net merit sires, but they also would be dominant for the, the poll characteristic. And how we go about doing that, I'm going to explain in this little video, which hopefully will um, uh, help you understand what, the, what I'm talking about. For centuries, animal breeders have selected individuals displaying desirable qualities and bred them to produce particular goals. Breeders are actually selecting unnaturally occurring DNA sequence variations that result in differences between individuals, like the color of a cow's coat. Using conventional breeding programs, achieving desired changes can take decades, especially in large livestock species like cattle, which have long generation intervals. Innovations in biotechnology are poised to help breeders improve the rate of genetic gain. University of California, Davis, animal geneticist Dr. Allison Van Enenem and members of her laboratory are exploring genome editing tools that could allow breeders to precisely introduce useful genetic variations into livestock breeding programs. Genomes are made up of DNA, containing the collection of genes, unique instructions detailing every characteristic of an individual, what they look like, the amount of milk produced, or resistance to disease. Genome editing offers an opportunity to edit these instructions precisely. One method to edit genomes is the CRISPR-Cas9 system. This system has two components, the Cas9 protein, which cuts DNA, and a guide molecule that directs Cas9 where to cut. Bound together, they form a complex that introduces a precise cut in the DNA. The break is then mended by the cell's natural DNA repair machinery. This can be used to inactivate undesired genes, like those that cause disease. Alternatively, the repair machinery can introduce useful DNA sequences which result in desirable traits, like heat tolerance. Genome editing complements traditional breeding methods. It has the potential to introduce useful traits like disease resistance and adaptability into genetic improvement programs, addressing some of the problems facing global agriculture. And so this is actually more than just a concept. A company called Recombinetics back in 2016 were actually able to use genome editing to introduce the hornless or polled trait into dairy cattle genetics. And so there are two bulls shown here that actually have been genome edited to carry the, the hornless alleles from um, the beef breeds. And that basically these bulls were bred at, to um, some horned Herefords here at Davis and resulted in six offspring. And of course, because they were passing on that dominant trait, these animals that were um, heterozygous for um, big P from dad and little P from the horned Hereford mum also did not grow horns. And we followed the development of these animals for the last two years and have analyzed the milk and meat from these animals. And basically the only difference that we could find was that they didn't grow horns um, and we didn't see any other um, unusual attributes. And you can see here um, a, a bull that was sired by the, a horned Holstein um, animal and alongside it, the two males that were the result of um, the, the polled genome edited bull. And similarly, here's some, a female and uh, she went on to have a calf and uh, we were able to analyze her milk. 
So will we be able to use this technology is really the question. Um, and that's going to come down to regulation. So would gene edited Paul Holsteins be subject to additional regulations in this country in the same way that genetically engineered or GMO organisms are? And the answer is kind of a toss up, um, depending where you are. So in some of our uh, major agricultural um, uh, countries like Brazil and Argentina, they wouldn't be triggering additional regulations. They'd be treated the same way as um, conventional breeding. But you'll notice down the bottom here that the FDA intends to uh, regulate these as new animal drugs in the same way that they did with genetically engineered organisms. And that's actually really different to the approach that's being taken by the USDA, where if you've genome edited a plant, um, their attitude is if you produce a variety that could have been developed through traditional breeding, then you're not going to be regulated as a genetically engineered organism. Whereas the FDA made kind of the opposite decision and said, well, if you used genome editing to introduce a trait, irrespective of whether that trait already exists in your um, in your species, then you're going to be subject to regulation as a, a new animal drug. Um, and that was introduced in 2017 um, and really threatens, I think, the ability of US agriculture to use this technology in livestock breeding programs. But just as the um, last administration was leaving office, there was a proposal to actually transfer the regulation of genome editing in animals over to the USDA. Um, there's a proposal to regulate the um, genome edited animals under the USDA uh, Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. And there's currently a, a comment period available in the Federal Register until May 7 of 2021. Um, as you can see, there's already been 43,000 comments submitted there. Um, and so if you're interested, I would encourage you to submit um, your comment to the, to the Federal Register. But in conclusion, genome editing offers an approach to precisely knock out undesirable traits and knock in desirable traits like polled in dairy cattle breeding programs. And it really opens up new opportunities for animal breeders to address critical problems such as disease resistance, animal welfare and resilience and product quality traits. But currently there's a patchwork of proposed regulatory approaches for the use of gene editing in food animal species, which will potentially result in trade disruptions. And the US currently has a proposed rulemaking to move regulatory authority of edits like Pauls that could have been achieved using conventional breeding from FDA to the USDA. And if you're interested in commenting, there's an open comment period available now through May 7, 2021. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll look forward to your questions. And with that, we'll turn to um, Betsy Carley, who's going to talk to us about feeding more milk. Does it pay? Pfizer with Cooperative Extension based in the Northern Sacramento Valley. My uh, talk today is on feeding more milk to pre-weaned calves. Does it pay? So why do we care? Um, we do know that in the pre-weaning period, if we can have improvements in average daily gain and calf health, we can expect more milk from um, that heifer as she becomes um, a member of the milking herd in her first lactation. Additionally, the better health will certainly lead to lower medicine cost. Um, and we can get there uh, with reduced failure paths to transfer and an improved nutrition program. Getting these calves to gain more weight in the pre-weaning period is going to drop that breeding age so that we can get uh, these heifers to first calving um, at an earlier age. And her overall longevity is impacted by her health in the pre-weaning period, making it really important to get her off to a great start. So we know that there are many um, building blocks to success for our calf raising program. Colostrum, of course, being foundational to that. Uh, our nutrition program, which we're going to talk a little bit more about today, and environment certainly plays a role. Um, but like I said, we'll focus specifically on the nutrition piece. And in that, both quality and quantity, of course, being important. But today, we're going to focus on the quantity of milk fed to pre weaned calves. So from some of our previous research, we know that it's pretty typical to feed about a bottle of milk uh, per calf per feeding. And, you know, that's about what uh, 
47%, almost 50% of our dairies are doing about a bottle a little bit more. There is a, a smaller number of dairies that are feeding less than that. Some of those potentially feeding more than twice a day um, or you know, just less milk overall. And uh, some of our herds have started to adopt more of an accelerated program, feeding upwards of five to, to six pints per feeding. So certainly a practice that's being done um, in California and hopefully can give you a little additional information um, to help make that decision uh, something you might consider on your dairy. So the specific study that I'm going to talk about today really looked at the dollars and cents um, of of increasing milk in fed to pre-weaned calves, specifically related to our research on respiratory disease. I've done a, a, looked at respiratory disease in pre-weaned calves from lots of angles. Um, and we did find that this practice uh, was associated with improved calf health. Respiratory disease in pre-weaned calves isn't cheap. Um, it absolutely has long-term costs, but we're really just focused on the short-term cost uh, at this time. We calculated those to be $42.15. Um, and that breaks down to a medication cost of $15.70. Labor for handling that calf, um, not only to treat her, but also to you know, help get her through that sickness and, and help her eat her meals. Uh, that was valued at $17.30, about a little over an hour of labor there. And then the loss of average daily gain was valued at $9.15. We figured these calves were not gaining weight for about a seven day period when they were fighting a respiratory disease. So those costs are accounted for as well. We calculated the cost of implementing the management practice with the Penn State uh, Calf Milk Pasteurizer Evaluation Spreadsheet that is available online uh, for your use as well. And uh, kind of diving into actually what we crunched numbers on. This was specific to increasing the daily milk fed um, from eight to nine pints. And this was specifically during the first 21 days of life. I won't get into the reasons why we specifically selected that, except just to tell you that that's what we found to be the most uh, significant predictor of improved calf health in this particular study. Not to say that there's not benefits to uh, increasing milk intake after that, just a little bit beyond the scope of what we're gonna dive into today. So this is a little bit more than uh, a bottle per feeding if we're on a, a two day or two times per daily feeding. This management practice specifically in our study decreased the respiratory or couldn't be predicted to increase the respiratory disease incidence um, in the herds in the pre-weaned calves by 92%. It was incredibly significant. Um, potential uh, management practice that, that can uh, lead to improved calf health. The cost of this uh, for the first 21 days came to $1.19 per calf. Uh, that calculates down to just, just under uh, six cents per calf per day to add that extra pint of milk. And ultimately we found that due to the improved health, um, we could, calculate a savings of $8.51 per calf in the pre-weaning period if the incidence rate of BRD was 25%. So that means over the pre-weaning period, 25% of calves in um, that calf cohort got respiratory disease. Really pretty common um, that a quarter of our calves would, would be uh, dealing, dealing with a pneumonia during that time period. We did even see though, perhaps respiratory disease isn't that big of a problem in your herd. We still saw savings of 75 cents per calf, even when the uh, incidence rate of BRD was, where only 5% of the calves in the pre-weaning period were, uh, were struggling with respiratory disease. So something to consider, even if uh, you know, it doesn't, BRD doesn't necessarily concern you at this time. Additional things to consider when um, feeding more milk. We have you know, a few different ways we can do that. We have these bigger bottles um, that are, are very common. We can just get a lot of more milk into those calves or, or even these bucket uh, teat feeders um, where we can easily feed quite a bit more milk. And I really wanna emphasize this because beyond respiratory disease, uh, our colleagues at the California Animal Health and Food Safety Lab have observed um, anecdotally that most of the calves that they're getting in for necropsy are undernourished. They really don't have 
any body fat reserves. So if they're dealing with a disease, they don't have a whole lot of energy uh, to get there. We've seen dairies that we've worked with um, in, in our studies that that are feeding upwards of two gallons a day. You know, a gallon a gallon per feeding, two two full bottles or one of these big bottles, and and it's working for them. Um, you know, kind of starting to get over get over those fears of it causing scours um, or other issues, and and seeing that it is done successfully. Like we mentioned, these calves need those energy reserves. We all know calves get sick. I think uh, that's probably not going to change for a long time, but they've got to be able to fight that disease. And this needs to happen on the front end before she gets sick, because we know she's not going to be gaining any weight as she's dealing with those pathogens um, effects, whether they're scours or respiratory disease, uh, she's going to need those energy reserves. And I just want to emphasize that, you know, especially I think with scours, we see this more, but we don't want to be withholding milk. Um, and we want to still be making sure we've got free access to water. I, I, the fundamental management practices that, you know, I just really want to emphasize. Um, I think we've moved past the withholding milk um, for scours, but, you know, I, I think it's important to uh, emphasize that in our feeding programs for these calves and really, you know, getting them jumped off to the, to the best start that we can give them. So as we mentioned, you know, nutrition is, is one of those uh, building blocks to success along with our colostrum environment and, and other factors. Um, absolutely have to give a shout out to the study team. Our uh, student who's now a veterinary student, Sasha Dubrovsky gets the um, most credit for uh, tackling, tackling the study, crunching those numbers and, and finding all the information. The paper is published. This is a published study that's available in the Journal of Dairy Science. Uh, feel free to contact me for that information or um, refer to the citation I have here at the bottom of the screen. And um, I am happy to uh, answer any questions here at the end of the session. And thank you very much. I'm Dr. Kudeda, and today I will be briefly talking about n microbial drug use decision making. The decision to treat or not an animal with antibiotics can be challenging and may involve multiple considerations that may include disease severity, cost of treatment, and animal productive value. One important question to have in our minds when making these decisions, especially in herd settings, is what are the driving factors causing disease? What could potentially be done to reduce disease prevalence and severity? And I'll talk a little bit about that today. This slide outlines my speaker disclosure, I am a faculty at UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine, and I have various projects and research contracts through CDFA and USDA. One approach for investigating disease causes is to split risk factors into three main areas. The where, or where the effect of the environment could play a role in the risk of disease. The what, or the potential role that a contagious or highly violent pathogen, for example, may have for disease dissemination and or severity. And the who, which takes into account individual animal factors that may be reducing the animal immune system resistance to disease or its ability to spontaneously recover from a disease without the need of antibiotic treatment. Disease can be caused by factors in one or multiple of these areas at the same time. Knowing what are the risk factors for disease is an effective approach to strategically and effectively fight disease. Although antibiotics are commonly the go-to option for treating disease, they do not come without a cost. Downsides from antibiotic treatments may include cost of the drug treatment itself and potential unwanted outcomes generated that in lactated cows could be having to discard uh, milk, which can add to a cost to the dairy. Although the best option for treating many diseases, antibiotics do have limited effectiveness. Disease severity at the time of treatment is a, a vital factor to consider and may play an essential role on treatment success, animal well-being, and cost effectiveness of treatment. Selecting and appropriately using antibiotics are essential steps to maximize antibiotic effectiveness when used and should be done in consultation with veterinarians, especially when outlining treatment protocol. Unfortunately, antibiotics do not only target disease-causing bacteria. 
and have been shown to affect normal bacterial flora, including the gut flora, which may result in increased risk of invasion in growth of disease-causing bacteria. One example is a study that compared treatment of diarrhea in calves using a conventional approach that treated all calves with diarrhea with antibiotics versus a targeted approach that focused on initial use of supportive therapies, such as treatment with electrolytes, and use of antibiotics only for the more severe cases that included signs of fever and depression, which indicated endotoxemia and septicemia. In this study, they observed that calves in the conventional therapy had 70% more days with diarrhea when compared to calves in the targeted therapy using supportive treatment as the first option. The cause for this was suspected to be disturbance of the normal gut flora by antibiotics in the conventional therapy group. Lastly but not least, any time antibiotics are used, there is a risk for increasing the selection of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. Given that sheer classes of antibiotics are used to treat both animals and humans, antibiotics used to treat a disease in livestock could result in a higher risk for selection of antibiotic-resistant bacteria that may cause disease in animals and humans. This is highly uh, important and to assure the extent effectiveness of antibiotics, we should always apply good stewardship for this shared resource. With that being said, how to guide our decisions to treat or not to treat with antibiotics and when? The best option is to avoid having to make that decision in the beginning by investing efforts and resources on disease prevention. This is not only usually the best outcome having in mind animal being, but also commonly the most effective approach increasing productivity and economical financial returns. An example of the cost of disease, a study that used an economical model tool to estimate the average cost of clinical mastitis in the first 30 days postpartum, estimated it to cost approximately $444. As you can see on the slide, this estimation included both direct costs that are usually the ones that we have in our mind that includes expenses from drug use and, and costs from non-saleable milk being discarded, but you can notice that most of the costs actually were indirect costs that include the future uh, milk production for these animals that is affected, as well as problems with uh, reproduction and cooling of these animals. Some examples for preventing disease include investing on preventive measures that take into account those areas that we talked in the beginning, thinking about causes and risk for disease. So this may include improving the environment, by providing comfortable housing to animals, improving animal resistance to disease, including through the use of vaccines and feeding colostrum to newborn calves, and reducing the spread of contagious pathogens that may cause disease in the farm, such as improving hygiene during milking and using effective hose dipping or teeth disinfectants. Even with best practices for disease prevention, disease can still occur. And the question remains, what can be done in those cases? The short answer is use antibiotics judiciously. I'm sure by now you may have heard about judicious use of antibiotics. And in one of the best descriptions in my opinions for judicious use of antibiotics is one defined by the Health for Animals organizations, which is treat as little as possible, as much as necessary. One of the first and in, in, in vital important steps to follow this rule is to have a rapid and accurate disease diagnosis on the farm. This will significantly improve treatment success. This may include training or retraining or having regular refreshers for on-farm knowledge of disease diagnosis. One example would be using some of the great resources produced in literature for visual detection of disease. One will include the one you can see on your screen, the UC Davis visual scoring chart for BRD and preven casts. Other examples include discussing protocols for disease diagnosis and treatment on the farm with your veterinarian. Another important step to ask is 
if non-antibiotic approaches are a viable option for that disease case. This will be disease specific, but overall diagnosing disease early will usually result in a higher probability that you will be able to use a non-antibiotic option. If animal is not severely sick, supportive therapy may be able to be used. And for one clear example, common example is oral electrolytes uh, for calves that may be showing diarrhea. And that alone may be enough to give that supportive care to the animal so that it can fight the disease on its own. Another step is to ask if antibiotic, antibiotics are to be used, how effectively will they be and if they are allowed to be used in that circumstance. So that's very important. This highlights importance, again, of early disease diagnosis, and I can't stress that enough, because knowing that what bacteria is causing disease and recognizing, in some cases, what antibiotic will be effective will be really important and will maximize the outcomes. And it is important to recognize that in some scenarios, antibiotics will not be effective and you may have to consider other options to assure animal well-being and welfare. After considering all these options, when the antibiotics are used, you should follow established farm protocols as well as routine dosage, duration and route of administration recommendations for that drug. Any extra label use of a drug is only allowed through a veterinarian with a few drugs not being allowed in any scenario to be used extra label. Two common examples include amorfloxacin and danofloxacin. Knowing what bacteria is most probably causing the disease will be important to identify the most effective antibiotic to use. Having established protocols that take this into account will help improve treatment success, especially in herd settings. A last important step is to have a follow-up plan for an animal after treatment. And this includes having expectations for cure and follow-up steps in case of treatment failure. Your veterinarian is a central source of information to outline and define many of these protocols and thresholds and to help you develop that program in your farm. Together, I hope that these steps help guide your decisions when treating sick animals with antibiotics, as well as improve your treatment success, productivity, and animal well-being on your farm. Wonderful, thank you so much. So we'll bring our three uh, speakers back and we'll start off with some questions. And again, if you have questions, feel free to put them in the question and answer section. Um, I'd like to start off with Allison. I noticed you answered the question in the Q&A about regulations, if they're geared towards the animal welfare or because the products are gonna be consumed by humans, thought you'd start with that one. Sure, so the, the FDA is using the um, Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act as the thing that they're regulating these um, genomic alterations with. And that act was originally developed, I think back in the 1950s, to basically ensure that drugs, and by drugs, they're really meaning pharmaceutical products given to animals for, to treat illness, were safe for the animal, safe for consumers, and safe for the environment. Um, so like, I don't know, ivermectin, for example, would have gone through an approval process to show that it kills worms. Um, and so they have interpreted that statute as being uh, relevant to genetic changes in animals. And so they're considering a single base pair change in the DNA of an animal as a drug, if it was introduced using genome editing, but not if nature did it. <laughs> um, because of course, animals are full of genetic variations. That's why Holsteins don't look like you know, jerseys. Um, and so it's a very strange um, kind of interpretation, in my opinion. But um, so it's really looking at is it is that genetic change safe for the animal, safe for consumers and safe for the environment? And so they ask exactly the same questions as they ask for dog warmer approval, um, some of which are just bizarre, like, you know, what do you do with the waste products from your factory? <laughs> it's like, well, well 
she pretty much just poos it out on the pasture along with everybody else. It's like, yeah, just kind of irrelevant questions for, you know, they're not a drug factory, they're a cow. Um, and so it, yeah, it becomes difficult to implement the, the regulations. Yeah, so I, I want to remind people they can scroll back up in the chat if you'd like to uh, let your thoughts be known to the FDA. Um, Dr. <laughs> yes. Van Eenenum did a really wonderful job explaining that, you know, if this whole trait uh, editing were a plant, it would not be a problem at all, but it's in an animal. And so, you know, we go down a different path. So just definitely uh, for those who have a passion one way or the other on this, um, I please contact the FDA, let them know what you think. Um, I'd like to go to Betsy next before I come back to Allison uh, and ask the question, what are the top two things that would be important to do to raise healthy calves? You've worked with lots of folks over the years in the calf department, so why don't you share those top two things? Well, I, I don't know if I can only pick two, but I'll, uh, I'll do my best. So obviously I'm gonna say nutrition and in order to get this down to two, I'm gonna lump colostrum in with nutrition. Um, so obviously getting that colostrum into that calf as quickly as possible, good quality colostrum from well-vaccinated cows, um, I think is, it, you know, ultimately the foundation. And then of course, um, you know, a really good feeding program with uh, quality ingredients um, as that calf goes through the pre-weaning period is actually absolutely imperative. And I'll throw environment in there too. I think, you know, we've got to keep these calves clean and, and comfortable. Um, it, you know, it's it's tough. They're, they are the, the debt um, center of the herd. They're not gonna make us money for a couple years, but I think really those investments in those calves and, and getting that that housing um, up to par, especially when we're dealing even this time of year with really wide swings in temperature, giving that calf the ability to stay clean and dry um, is absolutely imperative. Thanks, it reminds me when I was in high school, a friend had a t-shirt that said, you take care of the calves, they take care of you. And that's exactly what that is. Um, so turning back to Dr. Van Eenen and them, uh, there was another question in the chat box um, about uh, pleiotropic effects of the non-horn gene on other behavioral and economic traits in the cows. Yeah, so that's actually um, the study we were doing at Davis. So as I mentioned, we bred one of the polled bulls to six cows here that were horned Herefords, um, and they gave birth to six offspring that didn't grow horns. Um, but right there, you've already got a bit of an unusual animal because it's a dairy bull over the top of a horned Hereford beef animal that's living out in a pasture as if it's a beef cow. Um, and so I have a difficult time saying if they were behaviorally any different. They acted very much like all the other calves that were in the pasture with them, but they, um, you know, we don't normally have beef bulls running around at, at foot <laughs> as if they're in a beef situation. Um, but we did analyze um, the meat and milk um, from these animals. And it was kind of a bit of a weird experiment because what hypothesis are we testing that, that horns makes milk unsafe or that or horns lack of horns makes milk unsafe and so um we did the experiment we only actually got one heifer out of those five six offspring just by chance um so we have a, an n of one which is every scientist's favorite dilemma um because basically everything you do is anecdotal um but we bred we had bred a control female that was in that shot whose mum whose dad was a horned holstein crossed over the top of a, of a Hereford. And so we milked them simultaneously and their milk didn't differ from each other, but what are we looking for that would be a food safety risk? And so it, it becomes a little bit of a, a needle in a haystack kind of a question, because it's like, if you don't have a hypothesis as to what might be different or concerning or a risk, then you just kind of look at the components and it's like yep it's milk so yep they had milk and then the bulls made meat and it was just like all our meat, other meat so we didn't see anything different between them um and so i that's that's the, as much as i can tell you but it's an n of six which is not very satisfying um but how much money do you want to spend showing that polled animals are 
safe to eat when you've just eaten a you know a, a big mac made out of an angus burger i it's it just becomes a little silly at that stage drug residues that's a different matter but dna residues i don't know so that was that's the science we've done and we're just writing that up now for publication um but it's expensive to do this work and we have to incinerate all the animals and it allowed to enter the food supply and that gets expensive too and is to me kind of a needless waste of resources there's no reason that a polled animal shouldn't go in the food supply but that's we did that because they were under fda new animal drug provisions and so many of them already do go into our food supply <laughs> that's for sure so um i'd like thank you so much for that and i'd like to ask uh, dr Pereira. um you know you mentioned diagnose early and um treat with non-antibiotics. Would you like to expand on that, on, you know, perhaps through the life of the animal where we can diagnose early and treat treat the animals? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, that's a, a really good question. And and I felt very hard to put all that I wanted to put in 10 minutes because <laughs> there's so many and I had a hard time picking diseases. So uh, I think the, the low hanging fruit is, is definitely calves. Calves is the, the most vulnerable area in the, in the dairy, definitely for disease. And, and we still have a lot to learn and to improve in that area. And when we talk about how can we uh, improve the non-therapeutic uses, and I think that's very important. One example that I talked a little bit in, in the talk was especially diarrhea. That's still a disease, I think, on the dairy that we, we still use more antibiotics than we should. And, and we know from uh, evidence-based resources that antibiotics are not really helping in those cases, especially when we're early to diagnose that disease uh, earlier and really treat with some of these non-antibiotic options, so electrolytes, or uh, other options that can help improve the calf. And, and remember even the last time I talked at the, 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 this conference, I talked a little bit about probiotics too. And that's always a very promising area that unfortunately we still are developing research and, and reviewing how to use that and how effective it is and, and improving on that area. So I'd say uh, that would be one example. I really like what uh, Betsy said, because that's essential, like colostrum is going to be very helpful as I, I almost consider a non-therapeutic option because it's such a big immunological booster for that animal. It's going to be essential. Uh, and, and I think that a lot of the options for non-therapeutic options, it's not necessarily that they're not available. The biggest issue that I think we have right now in the industry a lot of times is, is that we don't detect the disease early enough. And part of that I feel a lot of times it's linked to training of employees or giving enough time for them to spend time monitoring that disease. And, and right now, we've, the industry is trying to develop some new tools to automize uh, diagnosis of disease in calves, especially. We quite haven't got there yet. We're getting advancing in dairy cows a lot of areas with uh, activity monitors, rumination monitors, but calves, we're still kind of um, working on that. So, so I'd say that would be an important area is just improving monitoring and, and spending time and training uh, employees in that area is exceptionally important and, and uh, will pay off in the long term. So, yeah. But that's a very, very short answer for a very big, big area that, yeah, you can go many different areas. <laughs> There's uh, definitely uh, every part of running and operating a dairy has layers of complexity to it. So we appreciate people for being brief today. Um, we do have another question. Are there technologies available to detect uh, early disease uh, in animals on farm? And, you know, we saw earlier that um, Dr. DePeters had used the rumination collars to see how often the cows were chewing, but are there other things that might be used from a health perspective? Uh, from a health perspective that's automized, we still don't have as many tools that I wish we did. We, even with some of the new equipment, through, even at Parlor, some of the new milking equipment that are collecting more data from individual animals as their milk, looking at individual characteristics. So that's one way that I know the industry has been trying to move forward. The rumination collars are very helpful in 
and even a lot of the new data that's coming through the pipeline, looking at that and trying to interpret that and establish thresholds that we have some of the technology, we just don't know yet to how to interpret it and to match that with animal behavior and to, to know when there's a mismatch with that. And, and I know that there are quite a few different studies that have been funded uh, by USDA right now that they're trying to get a lot of these different tools that were developed Mechanically, they work, but we still haven't linked that ability to effectively and accurately diagnose disease on the farm. And, and when I talk with farmers, even for some of the callers, sometimes when they initially put them in, they're very stressed because half of their animal show up as sick and then they're worried, oh my gosh, how do I choose them? And, and just increasing sensitivity of those methods is going to be really important as we move forward. But uh, a short answer would be, yeah, we're trying to go there. I can't tell you of one specific one that works really effective that I think you should have on your dairy. So there's still a big human component that it's really going to be difficult to replace in the next year until we really get to a technology level where just visual detection and, and motion of animals and we can actually really accurately diagnose disease and effectively do that. But uh, yeah, just using some of the tools that we already have for high, high risk for animals and then using uh, uh, either for mastitis cases, having, making sure you're using CMT, diagnosing your subclinical mastitis early. If you have mastitis cases, submitting milk cultures, really understanding what's happening in your herd and using some of those herd level tools to, to understand what the problems are will be important. But when we get to individual animal, unfortunately, we, we're still developing more and and become more accurate in that area. And I don't know if uh, Betsy or Allison have anything else to add on that too. It's, it's, a, it's a growing area. There's a lot of research I know in that area. We collect a lot of data on farm and it'll be really nice when we can integrate it in real time cow side to make it useful for us, for all the animals. Uh, we're at the end of our session. I, I really like to give uh, Dr. Van Eenen and the last uh, shout out for her picnic day activity. And we want to thank everybody for joining us and go for it, Allison. Yeah, I'm just going to share my screen. I think that is hopefully that showing. Um, and yeah. I think I put it in the chat if you want to sign up. Um, and we're really wanting to engage producers and the general public um, to have a, a, a robust discussion around this technology in, in animal agriculture. And if you answer the questions before and the end, you get a Starbucks coupon, so super worth it. Um, so join us virtually. You can do it sitting at home on your uh, couch, having a cup of coffee. And um, we look forward to having uh, an interesting discussion there. So thank you. Thank you. Well, we appreciate having all three of our speakers in this session and look forward to our next session. So uh, you get a bio break for a few minutes, answer your texts, check your emails. When you hear the cowbell, we're starting back up again. Thanks, folks. I hear a Dr. Meyer cowbell. That must mean we are right up against three o'clock. So welcome back everyone. Uh, welcome to session three. Um, I'm Betsy Carley, a dairy advisor in the Northern Sacramento Valley and I'll be moderating this session of today's webinar. Um, if you're just joining us, just to quickly review the process of how this is all working, we will be recording this event um, for educational and promotional use. You as attendees are muted, uh, so we don't have the background noise, but please, we encourage everyone to use chat for conversations, comments, um, and do direct that to all panelists and attendees, if you would like everyone in the audience to see that. Um, and then if you just want to chat with one of the panelists, you can certainly uh, just make that selection as well. Do, um, if you have questions, please do post those in the Q&A uh, session. It's right down there at the bottom of your screen next to the chat. We will be addressing the questions at the end of all three um, video presentations um, that will roll through in this session. We do have continuing education units available. Information is there on your screen. We have CCA units. These two sessions, three and four, um, are each one 
SDE unit. And uh, please do scan that QR code if that applies to you. And then you'll be getting a follow-up email with instructions um, on that as well. Also, ARPAS credits are available for this session, uh, one hour for each session, um, if you've attended some of our, our previous sessions as well. And then CDFA um, irrigation and nitrogen management training, formula, formerly known as the, the CURES credits, those are also available. So information there as well. Be looking for an email from our program support unit after um, the event. So this session focuses on um, crop production and water savings. So we're going to um, really be focusing on groundwater recharge, irrigation water savings, and new opportunities in, in dairy feeds with really some of the leading scientists um, in, in the field. So we are going to hear from Dr. Helen Dahlke about recharging groundwater aquifers by flooding alfalfa fields. And Dr. Dahlke is an associate professor in integra integrated hydrologic sciences at UC Davis. And then next we'll hear from Dr. Bob, Bob Huttmacher, um, who's going to discuss realized irrigation water savings from growing forage sorghum. Dr. Huttmacher is a cooperative extension specialist and uh, agronomy research scientist with the UC Davis Plant Sciences Department and also the director of our West Side Research and Extension Center. And our final presentation will be from Dr. Stephen Kafka on growing sugar beets and safflower as dairy feed in California. Uh, Dr. Kafka is also an extension specialist based in the Department of Plant Sciences at UC Davis. I'll be putting the bios um, of our speakers in the chat as we go and uh, we will roll through these uh, three 10 minute presentations and then come back together for a question and answer at the end of all three talks. Hi, my name is Helen Dahlke. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Land, Air and Water Resources at UC Davis. And I will be presenting on groundwater recharge using alfalfa fields as recharge grounds. Based on the first groundwater sustainability plans that have just been submitted for high priority groundwater basins in the San Joaquin Valley, uh, which currently has an estimated average ground overdra oh, groundwater overdraft rate of 2 million acre feet per year, uh, these plans have uh, laid out that about 50% of this overdraft is thought to be addressed by augmenting water supply through groundwater recharge of surplus water which mainly includes unclaimed flood water from big rainfall runoff events in the winter. Of course, the question is, how do we get this unclaimed flood water into the ground? Many water districts have already, of course, designated recharge basins or other recharge facilities in place, but land is expensive, so buying more acres for putting recharge basins in is a huge financial investment um, for recharging flood water that might only occur every five or seven years in that area of the Central Valley. So for those situations on farm recharge where farm fields are flooded with excess surface water during the winter to recharge groundwater might be a really valuable low cost and highly efficient alternative. In the Southern Central Valley, uh, where we have lots of dairies, we also have quite a few alfalfa fields surrounding them that might serve as recharge grounds. Alfalfa, uh, which is a nitrogen fixing perennial crop, is in many ways an ideal candidate because it has a low use of fertilizer and pesticides, uh, which typically present a low risk of leaching, for example, nitrate into the groundwater. Uh, fields are often also irrigated with flood irrigation, meaning that we have infrastructure in place that allows us to apply large amounts of water over short time periods. Uh, alfalfa fields often also serve as habitat for a wide variety of wildlife. And so if uh, flooded, they could even serve as habitat for migratory birds um, or any other waterfowl. Uh, but of course, the main purpose of growing alfalfa is because it serves as a feed for the dairy industry. So the main question we were interested in investigating through this research was uh, to determine how does winter recharge on alfalfa in warm winter climates um, on, on varieties that have a, a high fall dormancy rating, affect yield and a feed quality. To answer this question, we set up a replicated experiment at the Kernia Research and Extension Center near Parleo, California, 
uh, on a two-year-old alfalfa stand, uh, which had a fall dormancy rating of eight, which means it's semi-non-dormant, so it's not really st stopping uh, the growth during the winter. Um, the alfalfa was planted on a hand-fired fine silt loam, uh, which is, um, uh, has a recharge suitability rating of good. Uh, on that side, we tested three treatments consisting of two flood treatments and one control, where we implemented three replicates. Um, the two flood treatments consisted of a low frequency treatment where water was applied for four consecutive days, followed by 10 days of no water application, and a high frequency uh, re uh, treatment where we applied water for three consecutive days, followed by four days of no water application for the duration of six weeks. Uh, we started the experiment on February 11, 2019, and um, continued for six weeks on. Over that period, we recharged about uh, between five and 12 acre feet uh, per acre uh, in each flood treatment. And uh, before we started the experiment, the alfalfa was actually cut about four weeks prior to the recharge. So plant cover was fairly low in the plots, um, which allowed weeds to grow. So in week four, we also applied an herbicide to burn down some of the weeds. This graph here uh, shows some of the environmental conditions that we measured during the experiment. Rainfall and temperature near the top, volumetric water content at three depths at the bottom, and applied water amounts uh, for the high frequency flood treatment in this case, and oxygen content in the root zone in the center graph. You can see here that with each subsequent water application, the oxygen content in the root zone dropped and then recovered some during the drainage period. But after about four weeks or so, uh, we reached an oxygen content in the soil that can be considered as uh, anoxic, which uh, often interferes with ro root respiration and nutrient uptake. Uh, we measured alfalfa yield for the first and second cutting of the season. The first cutting occurred about four weeks after we ended the flooding for recharge, so towards the end of April. And um, both cuttings did not show significant any significant difference in yield um, between the control as well as the two flood treatments, indicating that pulsed flooding did not really have an effect on overall biomass production. We also sent samples uh, from the first and second cutting for feed quality analysis to determine whether winter recharge has an effect on hay quality. Here you can see some of the hay quality parameters listed that are typically also used to determine the value or price of the hay. And so overall we found that the alfalfa and the flood treatment had a lower digestible fiber content than the control. Amulase uh, treated detergent fiber content, so the insoluble fiber content was higher in the flood treatments than in the control, while um, the flooding did not seem to have an effect on crude protein content. Um, yeah, we also found that ash content was uh, fairly high across the treatments, but that could have been due to the uh, a uh, way we harvested the hay, which was with a small harvester and not the commercial harvesters that are typically used. Uh, because it looked like the hay quality is impacted by the winter flooding and because hay quality in the control was also somewhat low, we decided to repeat the experiment in 2020 with some small modifications to the setup. So instead of having the uh, control plots between the flood treatments, we decided to move the control to the adjacent check. And we also took a second control sample from the opposite side of the field here shown as the commercial control. Due to COVID-19, uh, the onset of the pandemic, uh, we couldn't start the experiment until uh, early April. And so um, overall we recharged a total of um, yeah, about five acre feet per acre in the low flat treatment and about eight acre feet per acre in the high flat treatment. And again, because of the late onset of the experiment, uh, we were actually not able to harvest the hay in the flood plots uh, during the first cutting on May 12th, which resulted in double the yield during the second cutting. But overall, again, we did not see a significant difference in yield between the control 
and the fl flood treatments after the first four harvests. But it looks like the anoxic conditions in the flood treatment influence nutrient uptake as indicated here by the uh, lower mean potassium content of the hay that we found in the flood treatments compared to the control. We again measured several hay quality parameters and found that the hay in the flood treatment had a higher insoluble fiber content than the control, although the total insoluble and least digestible fiber content of the hay in the control was also not great. Uh, this was likely caused by the management of the stand during the winter. So in contrast to the 2019 winter where we did cut the stand just prior to the flooding, in 2019, in 2020, the stand was cut in the late fall and then allowed to grow over the winter. So the canopy was actually quite mature at the time when we started the flooding experiment. So it's not clear at this point whether the low quality uh, was purely just a result of the winter flooding. So to summarize, uh, flooding semi-dormant alfalfa fields for groundwater recharge in the winter, in a warm winter climate, did not negatively impact alfalfa yields, but allowed uh, us to recharge between 5 and almost 12 acre feet per acre of water uh, on this well-drained soil. High frequency or continuous flooding is likely creating short-lived anoxic conditions in the root zone that will influence nutrient uptake and potentially hay quality. And so for that purpose, it's also very critical to carefully manage the stand during the winter uh, so that uh, winter flooding effects on hay quality as well as weed pressure are reduced. However, I think flooding of alfalfa fields might be particularly a great option in areas that see floodwaters at a somewhat irregular frequency. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, Nick Clark and my students and postdocs for their continuous help on this research project. Thank you very much. And we will, uh, thank you, Dr. Dalkey. We'll go ahead and roll into our next uh, presentation from Dr. Bob Hutmacher. Thanks for the opportunity today to present some information uh, about some sorghum irrigation management field evaluations that a number of us shown on the screen have conducted over a number of years at the Westside Research and Extension Center, at the Kearney Research and Extension Center, and uh, in cooperation with the University of California Extension uh, folks and UCB Plant Sciences. One of the things to uh, consider in looking at water use of uh, any crop, but certainly it's true in sorghums, is that there can be quite a diversity of what you're calling sorghum, and that's important to keep in mind. So there are height differences, there's ground cover differences, and maturity differences that can impact the amount of time that the crop is out there in the field, as well as how quickly it does things like ground cover uh, that have an impact on water use. Uh, another major thing to consider is that there are cultivar differences in rooting patterns and how those plants may be able to extract uh, additional soil water uh, when you deficit irrigate. The Some sorghum characteristics that can be important if you're deficit irrigating or considering it is that the plants in many cases can tolerate significant water stress and still be able to resume vegetative growth even after water stress induced dormancy that might occur with more severe stress or just a slowing of growth that occurs with more moderate stress. And this can be due to a wide range of different water stress tolerance mechanisms that are present in sorghum cultivars or some cultivars, as well as a root system depth and distribution, the duration of growth, uh, which again, all these things can vary across cultivars. Some generalizations regarding when to uh, cut back or def consider deficit irrigation in sorghum considering grain sorghum, you don't want to impose, for example, severe stress on the plants during the first 30 to 50, 35 days after emergence because that's when panicle differentiation occurs. That can have a big impact on yields uh, if you uh, impose a severe stress. With forage sorghums, they're somewhat similar to grain sorghum, but you can get away with delaying the first irrigation, particularly if you're planting a long season uh, photoperiod sensitive type. Uh, 
One thing to consider, if you have very dry conditions uh, at or after planting, you may need some irrigation just to encourage emergence, a good stand, and root system development. What you don't want to do is damage the plant too severely right at that establishment stage or if the plant, if it has an ability to uh, extract stored uh, soil water from deeper in the profile, you may damage the ability. So we did a series of irrigation studies at both the Westside Research Center in a clay loam soil and at the Kearney Research Center in a sandy loam soil, differences in soil water holding capacity across those types. For each of the subsequent slides, I just wanted to point out that we had essentially about five different irrigation treatments that we were looking at in many of these studies. Going from T1, shown on the left, which would be uh, basically non-stressed uh, water application during the entire season. Uh, T2 was a late stress. We eliminated late irrigations, uh, and that's when a stress would occur. T3, early stress of reduced applications in the early part of the season, and T4, multiple time periods with less water, and T5, the most stressed, and that resulted in applications ranging from a low of a little under 8 to about 18 and a half inches of applied. West side, again, with a higher water holding capacity, you put on more water per irrigation. Again, the same type of treatment combinations, though, ranging from a low in the T5 of about 7 and a half inches to a high of 18 and a half applied water. Of course, if you're looking at a crop response to uh, deficit irrigation, one of the things that's really important is not to look just at applied water, but also add in sort, stored soil water use. So over the course of the season, we basically looked at how much water was extracted from the top eight feet of the soil profile, and the soil water use extraction or net extraction over the course of the season is shown in the pink hatched part on these the total water use of the crop, or the ET of the crop, then, is that applied water shown in gray, plus the soil water, net soil water use over the course of the season. You can see that in the least stress treatments, uh, only about three and a half inches of water was used, uh, shown in pink. In the highest uh, stress treatment, uh, almost eight inches of water was extracted out of the profile, uh, which is a little more than what was applied. One other thing to keep in mind is that not all cultivars are going to be the same in terms of maturity timing. This is some data just shown for grain sorghum types where we looked at these same five treatments and you're looking across uh, as you go from left to right from an earlier maturing to a mid maturing to a later maturing one. And you can see that there are, they may be slight, but th there's about a 10% difference. Uh, 10 to 15 percent difference in total ET of the later maturing cultivars compared to the early. Now how did this impact uh, yield uh, responses uh, to these deficit treatments? I'm just going to show a little bit of data. This is uh, just to set this up on the left is forage sorghum yields uh, corrected to 70 percent moisture and on the right is silage moisture content and this is five different uh, cultivars that are shown in the different colors across the bottom irrigation treatments from the t1 the least stressed to t5 the most stressed and as you can see the generalized type of responses uh, like the irrigation t2 when you eliminate some late irrigations uh, what happens to yields? If you T3, you eliminate early irrigations. What happens to yield? Or the most stressed T5, and you can see the generalized type of responses, but also different colors there are the different cultivars, so significant cultivar differences in response. And this just shows for the Westside Research Center location, clay loam soils. Again, the same five cultivars, the same five irrigation treatments, and again, uh, a range of different responses uh, with the different cultivars that are important. Another way of looking at this data, this is uh, for the Kearney location in one of the years. Uh, crop water use is shown in purple bars, and the crop yields is shown in green bars in this particular study. So uh, if you look across the bottom, those are five different sorghum cultivars plus a corn cultivar uh, shown across the bottom with the numbers signifying the different five irrigation treatments. And again, uh, it's important to at least consider uh, some of the differences in cultivar responses, and th th those are shown here. And again, the generalized relationship with uh, declining amount of applied water 
in particularly in the more severe deficits, uh, corresponds with uh, declining yield. Another way of looking at these yield data sets is to look at the forage yield. This is the same data set in tons per acre per unit of crop water use. So how much dry matter is produced per crop water use in inches. And these numbers, again, this is set up like the previous one. The sorghum, different sorghum cultivars are shown across the bottom. And the numbers represent the five different irrigation treatments for a sorghum cultivar shown in blue and then the corn cultivar shown in gold in this case. And across this data set, the forage yield per unit soil water uh, use plus irrigation averaged about 14% higher in the forage sorghum cultivars across the different levels than in the corn cultivars. And this similar types of numbers around 10 to 15% uh, differences in yield per unit crop water use were what we saw consistently with corn. And again, I'll just point out that it's important to look in more detail if you're looking at uh, a particular variety to gain some information on uh, individual variety responses, uh, which may differ in some cases. Finally, I wanted to conclude with some information about a, a study uh, where we did looked at interactions between applied water and nitrogen fertilizer levels at west side and clay loam soil. In that particular study, we did find, for example, that sorghum yields did peak at the intermediate irrigation level, which was about 75% of estimated corn ETC, while corn yields uh, increased uh, going all the way from the 75 to the 100% ETC level. So in uh, gold and green on the right, you can see those are labeled, those are the corn uh, ETC treatments and the corn yield responses. You could see that the yields increased uh, as you went from 50 to 75 to 100 percent. And then the three lines that are identified in this uh, graph for sorghum are going from the dashed blue in the middle to the 75 percent and the 100 percent treatments in the sorghum. And again, you could see that the sorghum yields did not increase uh, even at the different nitrogen fertilizer application levels as you went from 75 to 100 percent. So again, higher yields with less water in the sorghum in part were due to greater growth rates with less water. And also you can attribute some of that to a deeper root system that can develop in, in this type of situation for the sorghum culture as opposed to the corn. Most of these study sites, it's important to note that the sorghum cultivars had good storage soil moisture in the upper four to five feet of the profile. We had low ETs of about 11 to 14 inches in the low water treatments, ranging up to 19 to 24 in the high water application treatments. And again, it's important to note that crop water use for sorghum cultivars was strongly related to time to maturity, i.e., you know, longer season, more water. Some evidence also that eliminating or reducing early season irrigations reduced yields more than eliminating late season irrigations and that helpful in trying to plan for uh, deficit irrigation. Thank you. And our final speaker in this session uh, will be Dr. Stephen Kafka on growing sugar beets and safflower. Hi, my name is Steve Kafka and I wanna to talk to with you briefly about um, a couple of alternative crops for feed uh, for dairy cows in the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, to start off, though, I want to set the framework for why we think why we think these are interesting uh, for dairy producers. Clearly, we have a significant or a significant regulatory challenges to dairy producers in the state. Um, groundwater overdraft in the San Joaquin Valley, especially, has been a problem and is now being regulated by uh, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act or Sigma and nitrate pollution of groundwater has uh, certainly also been an ongoing issue. It's particularly seems to be concentrated in dairy areas. So how does how to address that? How to main, help dairies uh, survive in the, under the midst of these kinds of regulatory pressures? Well, one way to address it is to grow crops in winter instead of summer feed crops well, so that uh, they're much more water sufficient uh, producing dry matter in winter than in summer for adapted crops. And the second is to grow crops with deep root, root systems that recover both nit nutrients and water um, as they go. Um, why beets? Well, that, as I meant, uh, beets are, have a lot of uh, advantages from 
terms of San Joaquin Valley production. They're salt tolerant, boron tolerant, they're deep rooted. They've grown in the valley for years and years. They're well adapted to the climate. They can be planted in fall and harvested in early summer to maximize water use efficiency. And during that period, there's minimal to no pests and disease pressure compared to summer. They help diversify rotations and improve flexibility. And uh, we've seen increasing yields with sugar beets in the last decades. Uh, so now the yields are the highest in the world in California where they're still produced. So the hypothesis is, uh, or the question, can crops be used strategically to improve water and nutrient management on dairies while also providing high quality feed? This is from older work that uh, I've been thinking about these issues for quite a while. This is more than two decades old. This shows soil water depletion by July for a sugar beet crop that had been planted in October under somewhat water limiting conditions. And you can see that water depletion is occurring down to nine feet. So I want to saw it briefly and talk just about the two, the two crops starting with sugar beets. This is our team, uh, Peter Robinson, Gene Axlin, Nick Clark, and Kusama Sukhara from all, most of them. Now, the older literature and work on beets, there's been a lot of work done, and depending on when you plant them, they can use more or less water. So most people think of it as a water, uh, it's a heavy water crop, but here you can see for beet crops planted in October and harvested in June, only really about two acre feet of water would be required, whereas for the same crop planted in the spring and harvested in the fall, you'd have 39 to 40 inches of, of water required. So that right there is a significant savings. And we found that uh, to be true in our own work, um, where basically uh, we planted a crop in October, this is some years ago at the West Side Field Station where we measured water use and found very little uh, irrigation required for harvest in May, more required in June and more in July, it's obvious. But applying water at about 60 to 70% of crop ET, letting the crop recover the rest of the water from uh, Soil profile allowed beets to be grown with irrigation requirements of one and a half to less than two acre feet of water, which is very efficient for the amounts that uh, can be produced. We've had, uh, we're in our third year of trials on dairies. This is from the first year at the Legacy Dairy near Pixley. Um, they planted in at the end of October and harvested it towards the end of June. They had uh, strip till, so it was very, uh, wasn't much tillage involved. They got very good stands. You can see a very robust beet canopy and crop in April here. And uh, very high yields were uh, observed on the farm. The field averaged almost 60 tons fresh weight of roots per acre. That's from our hand harvest samples from all over the field. Quite a few uh, tops and crown leaves as well, but we didn't harvest those and they weren't used. The higher, the higher yielding variety was over 60 tons. So um, they were very effective, very, had a very robust yield. These uh, roots were dug uh, and then coinciled with almond hulls. Uh, beets are only about 20% dry matter and they would seep or leak wa uh, sugary water. So to absorb that, uh, we added almond hulls, which are obviously quite abundant and they coincided quite well and made high, high quality feed that was readily eaten by the cows. The second year, last year, we were, moved to a smaller dairy. This was a Rio Blanco dairy near Tulare. That's more of a, it's a moderate sized dairy, more owner operated, a little more land constrained than the uh, pick, dairy near Pixley. And they planted a, a couple of weeks later and harvested um, about 10 days earlier. So they had a shorter growing season. Uh, they had lower yields. It was about 43 tons per acre, though parts of the uh, field went up to 55 tons. It was more variable. Their, ag their crop production practices weren't quite as uh, effective as in the free previous farm. Um, it's always good to work on farm and see how these things vary. We saw quite a substantial uptake of nitrogen from the crop. Uh, there was quite a lot of leaf material, so a lot of the nitrogen was in the leaf material, but the beets recovered about 260 pounds of N as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about safflower. I'll talk about feed quality in, at the end. I want to talk a little bit about safflower. Safflower um, is probably the deepest rooted annual crop that I know of. People have been monitoring soil water depletion in safflower for years. Henderson's work was done in the 50s and 60s and, and documented soil water depletion to 10 feet here on, in the yellow soil on campus at Davis. 
we documented at the, uh, in the West Side Field Station, the same kind of soil water depletion over the April to August period down to nine feet as well. And also documented uh, recovery, uh, high yielding safflower with absolutely no fertilizer based on soil nitrate levels. So it has great promise. And on campus last year, you could see pictures where in fact, this seems to be what happened. Safflower um, uh, roots were evident in our April harvest at nine feet and in our May harvest down to almost 12 feet. So in fact, it does have that kind of capacity. This is what the crop looked like. Um, it was planted in the end of November and irrigated up with about three acre inches of water. We harvested at the end of April, the main crop and made it into silage, uh, compressed bale silage. This was a large field trial. We used farm equipment. We spread about a six tons, five to six tons of dairy manure on the field. And some of the plots got either 100 or 200 pounds of nitrogen per acre, trying to basically up fertility. Some plots got zero uh, manure and zero fertilizer. We monitored soil water using Nissan access tubes throughout the growing season and sampled frequently as the crop developed for quality. This is what the harvested material, chopped material looked like prior to baling um, at the end of April. You can see the different amounts of material produced by each of those treatments. And we had compressed round bales that the Gombos brothers put up for us in, uh, up in Woodland and uh, they were they were very stable over a six month period and fermented quite well. The yields were very quite large as you can see from some of the pictures. We had over 30 tons fresh weight yield in our high end treatment, over six tons of dry matter starting from a basically November through April. And so it was quite a bit of dry matter material. So um, the other crop that can be grown in the winter is winter cereals. And these are data from Peter Robinson over from a number of different crops averaged for winter cereals and compared to safflower silage and sugar beet almond hull silage. Uh, the sugar beet almond hull silage over both years was quite consistent in quality. So this is an average, this is just from the most real stary. Um, you can see crude protein values slightly lower in safflower than winter cereal on average. Um, the NDF values are fairly comparable between safflower and winter cereal. The sugar beet NDF values and ADF values are quite low. Sugar beet has no lignin in the roots. It's basically all digestible and fermentable fiber. So it's really a different kind of feed, whereas safflower and winter cereals might be called forage feeds. The sugar beet almond hull silage is definitely an energy feed and is somewhat equivalent to corn silage in terms of its feeding value. So that gives you a rough idea of what that's like. The um, safflower crop um, used about 15 acre inches of water, again, demonstrating uh, there was soil water depletion measured down to nine feet using our access tubes. So that it looked efficient and uh, we recovered between 200 and 300 pounds of nitrogen per acre in the above ground dry matter, um, depending on the actual treatment. So we have trials in safflower at the T-Bar Dairy uh, this year and also at the SBS Dairy. This was a picture taken uh, uh, about a month ago, not quite a month ago. Safflower is almost five and a half, six feet tall. It was planted October 1st. We estimated almost 35 tons fresh weight forage at that date from October 1st. It hasn't been harvested yet. It's probably be harvested next week. It's going to be yet higher again. Nitrate contents were high, just as we would have predicted, because of course, one of the goals is to recover nitrogen from these fields. And a lot of these fields have been open manured or manured very heavily for decades. And so there's a lot of nitrate there and the safflower is responding to it. Maybe as much as 270 pounds in the field at this stage in the crop. So when it's made into silage, we'll have to get some care with feeding and with concerns about uh, nitrogen dioxide at when the, sa when the silage is first put up. That's all we have. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much to all of our speakers in session three. Um, I invite you to uh, turn on your video and uh, join us for our question and answer session. Um, I have had several questions come to me directly, um, but please do folks uh, fill out that, that Q&A um, if you do have any additional questions. So I'll start off with the ones that 
that I have received and uh, we can take it from there. So first of all, um, Dr. Dalkey, we'd like to ask you, uh, in your study, it was very, very interesting to see about recharging uh, groundwater in the San Joaquin Valley. And, and of course, we know that there's quite a bit less surface water available in that area than say, for example, the Sacramento Valley. So do you feel um, like in the work you've done so far that, that this strategy uh, of recharge would be something that producers really could adopt is the amount of uh, surface water available to implement this practice um, sustainable? Yeah, as, um, as, as alluded to in my, in my talk, I think it's a great practice, particularly for areas where we don't see floodwaters on a regular basis. So um, in an area where we might see a wet year or above normal precipitation year, maybe once every five or once every seven years, um, if there is the decision to make whether or not to buy land, um, you know, which requires quite a bit of capital costs to take that out of production to convert it into an infiltration basin, which then only sees water every five or seven years, this would be a fairly high, you know, investment compared to the return. So for those um, regions, I think on-farm recharge is a really excellent alternative and um, particularly, you know, if, if your economic impact on the crop that might be, you know, negatively impacted by the practice um, is fairly, you know, manageable and not, you know, devastating. So I think it's a good, a good alternative for those regions. Well, thank you. A question that we have in the Q&A um, for Dr. Kafka, what can you do with high nitrate safflower um, if it's not used for feed? Well, the whole point is to use it for feed. Um, depending on how much nitrate actually ends up in the silage, um, some of it will break down and convert into microbial biomass in the in siling period. But it would have to be fed with, you'd have to know your nitrate contents and you'd have to feed it with care. Um, and it would have to be part of the total mixed ration uh, analysis and, and feed combinations. Um, we're really, um, last year's crop was, was fed kind of uh, informally. Uh, this year we'll have, we have a couple of dairies where they're gonna be feeding it where we're gonna be keeping better track of that, but um, it is an issue. But the, pro but the primary issue is that many fields have been very heavily manured and fertilized for many years and the nitrates are there. So the consequence of that is if you grow a crop that it can recover it, you have to manage, you have to manage it. It's another element of management that has to be added to um, what you might call progressive or, or modern dairy management. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Huttmacher, I think uh, we can all anticipate that we might have quite a bit of interest in sorghum this year, uh, being as we're looking at a drought year again. Any tips for growers who might be growing uh, sorghum for the first time or uh, lessons learned in all of your research that you'd like to impart on the group? Um, well, I think, I think one of them that I, that I mentioned was just that there are, is a, a very wide diversity in cultivars out there that are called sorghums. Um, if people are used to grain sorghums, for instance, usually they're used to something that's maybe three or four feet tall, they're, or they're used to ones that are like the dual purpose types that are maybe six or seven feet tall under San Joaquin Valley kind of production conditions. But again, there's big differences in tonnage uh, and some other characteristics of some of those materials. There's BMR types as well uh, that are available. And one of the things they might wanna do is take a look. There's a, a UCANR website just under sorghum.ucanr.edu. Uh, that they can go into and take a look. And there's results from a variety of evaluations that were coordinated by Jeff Dahlberg with participation from a bunch of other people. A lot of different seed companies put entries in there. So there, there's quite a range of data. You can look at it over multiple locations, multiple years, and that might help in kind of sorting through what options are out there for cultivars. And I think the other thing I would mention about sorghum is just that one of the big advantages with sorghum is that if you do 
have it in a situation where you're really pinched for water and you decide you're gonna put your water on your almond trees or your pistachio trees and you're gonna cut back somewhere, sorghum's a lot more plastic sort of in being able to uh, adjust and recover from a, even a moderate water stress compared to something like corn. And uh, that, that's something that you know, growers will get used to when they start growing it on their ground. When you start seeing leaf rolling and some of the symptoms of water deficits, usually the sorghum will come back uh, pretty rapidly with rewatering. Great, thank you. And thanks to Nick Clark for putting that um, website in the chat. So if interested, please do, uh, do grab that link out of the chat to that sorghum website. Uh, Dr. Kafka, another question for you. I heard that root knot nematodes are a problem for growing sugar beet. Do they affect the taste and feeding quality of the crop for cows? Well, I don't know about um, taste and feeding quality. They certainly affect yield. You see root knot nematodes largely on coarse textured soils, uh, and they don't they don't originate spontaneously. If the field has root knot nematodes, it's not going to be a good candidate for um, sugar beets. There's also sugar beet cyst nematode. There's a few places in the Central Valley where they were an issue, not so much typically in the San Joaquin Valley. There are a few areas in Eastern San Joaquin County that seem to be problematic around Tracy particularly. But um, um, generally, uh, Winter production is a cure-all for a lot of problems, if, especially if there are nematodes, you can probably get good growth before there's much serious affection. But by and large, um, I wouldn't grow sugar beets in nematode infected soils. It's not a good idea. Where they don't exist, uh, I have no idea really about quality. I doubt that they, they don't look very good to my eye when you see an infected root, so I'm not sure how a cow would regard it. Fair enough. Uh, Dr. Dalkey, another question for you. Um, you talked about alfalfa fields today. Is this type of groundwater recharge something that could be done on other crops, other soil types, or is alfalfa really kind of the best um, crop type to, to use this system on? Yeah, I mean, of course, uh, recharge can be done on fallow fields. It can be done on pasture. Um, it can be done to some extent in vineyards and even almond orchards. Um, we're slow in making progress in evaluating which crops are actually really suitable. Um, and there's not much literature out there that has really looked into those questions. Um, it's, it's basically just, um, I guess, an appeal to, you know, uh, at the multi-benefit of, you know, using farmland for various uh, purposes and um, the dairy industry recently has started to make really a push into sustainability and so uh, you know potentially becoming part of the solution of addressing some of the groundwater issues we have in the valley and so you know dairies that might have alfalfa fields that are not receiving manure um, might be therefore a good choice. So, you know, for those there's maybe a limited number of fields they can actually do this on. But, and, you know, if they, if they do have those and they might be planted with alfalfa. But um, it looks like alfalfa is, um, is pretty tolerant, um, you know, and I, I shall add, um, of course, we're always interested in our research to take it to the extreme. <laughs> So you don't have to flood a field for six weeks, you know, to really um, deteriorate it to, to the extent that it does not produce, you know, to your standards, um, you know, just maybe doing a few days, um, you know, maybe one or two weeks is enough, most likely to make a difference on the water side. Great, and then in the Q&A, um, Dr. Dolphy, we have an, another question for you. Any thoughts on using subsurface reverse tile drains on dairies for recharge? Yeah, I think that's a technology that's coming on more and more. Um, I've seen it, um, I've seen some growers install it even below orchards. Um, so they have like come in with like a system where they place the uh, reverse drain tile at about eight or 10 feet um, below soil surface. 
Uh, we have not had the chance really to study it with a grower, um, but in the soil, or let's say if you know what's beneath that eight or 10 feet, so we're assuming there's no impeding flow layers, like you know clay layers or something, it could be a great way of putting water away that is then not touching the root zone and might be you know causing some issues of water logging. Um, however, often we don't really know much about you know the the subsurface below the soil profile because it's really data that's not publicly available or even surveyed to a large extent. So um, that's kind of a little bit the risk that the grower will have to take. Um, but um, yeah, it could be a good way to do it. Great. It's actually um, there's actually a long history of work with drainage water in the San Joaquin Valley, especially on the west side, and um, there's been fairly significant characterization of water in at least some low-lying low areas where you had uh, perch water tables. And trace elements are a particular issue, at least on the west side. Again, it may be different on the east side, but there is a history of that. So there's information out there, at least in part. Yeah, I, I would respond to that, that the west side, Westlands particularly, is not the best recharge ground for that reason. <laughs> <laughs> they have typically fairly uh, heavy soils to start with, um, and they have these chemical limitations, and we don't necessarily want to move those chemicals further into the groundwater. So west, west side of the San Joaquin Valley is a little bit a challenge. So is the Tular Lake Basin or Lake Bottom. <laughs> How about potentially um, being a less expensive option than in orchards, um, as far as the potential of not having to bury the pipes, you know, that eight feet deep? Yeah, I mean, um, we've we've done a study with the almond board, and almond trees um, didn't really seem to react much to the amounts of water we applied. The, the one issue that almond trees have is that they're starting to bloom so early. So if water availability is later in, this, in the winter or spring season and not before you know, early February, then um, you have to pick a different crop because um, yeah, once uh, the almond trees are starting, they're a lot more vulnerable to any um, excess water than they are during the dormancy. Um, vineyards are actually quite an excellent choice. We have several trials going on in, on vineyards right now. Um, they don't typically leave out until the end of March. So definitely a longer period, but they're also riparian species. They are much more used to having wet feet than um, you know, some of the other crops that, that are out there. So um, yeah, we've also done some trials on annual crops. So, uh, you know, which often are producing fallow fields in the winter, and they are quite excellent too. Great. Uh, another question for uh, you, Dr. Kafka, on the ash content of both the beets and, um, and the safflower, that, that ash content seemed to be a little higher. Did you look into that at all in any of your studies on the nutrient quality? Um, yes, the ash content has to be adjusted, has to be taken into account. The safflower uh, ash content, we think, was an artifact of the experimental conditions. Field was fairly rough. Um, there were a lot of clods left in it when it was planted, and we think some of that got mixed up when it was harvested. The hand samples were closer to 10% ash content than the actual uh, silage analysis. So it's an issue. That was the first trial ever in the history of California um, using safflowers as forage. So uh, we're, in, we're still in learning mode around that issue. Beets are a root crop. They're uh, roots, so they come out of the ground. So you'd have to be careful about moisture. Um, typically, the uh, soil, what they call soil tear on beets, is quite low in California because you can harvest them under fairly dry conditions. That's not true in other parts of the world where they're harvested often in the autumn and the rainy period. So, um, but it is an issue. There will be a little bit of soil contamination uh, uh, on these beets. If it became an issue, they might have to be washed. Makes sense. All right, well, I am going to 
cut it off there for questions. Thanks everyone so much. Thanks to our speakers for their presentations. Thanks to the audience for the great questions. We will come back here um, in 10 minutes, take a quick break and we'll be back for our last session. We'll be looking at uh, priority nitrate management zones um, returning at four o'clock. See you soon. Okay, good afternoon and welcome to session four of the University of California Golden State Dairy Management webinar. Uh, my name is Jennifer Hagee. I'm a farm advisor in the Northern San Joaquin Valley and I'll be moderating this session. Um, if you're just joining us, I'll quickly review the process we'll follow for this session. Um, first, this event will be recorded for educational or promotional use by UC, um, but you will be muted and without video, without video throughout the entire session. Um, please feel free to use the chat function of Zoom for non-question conversations or comments. Uh, you can change the to field to send your message to specific groups within the Zoom webinar. If you have questions for the speakers, we please ask you to post those in the question and uh, answer section. Uh, we'll have the speakers answer uh, any of those questions um, all together at the end of the third presentation. So please go ahead and fill in those, those questions as we're moving through the presentations. Um, we do offer continuing education units for this seminar. Uh, information for CCA units are on the left. You can scan the code using your CCA app or wait for an email with information after the webinar. Uh, there is one unit of ARPAS credits approved uh, for this particular seminar um, with a total of four units available if you've been with us um, since the program started um, back with nutrition. Lastly, uh, there are CDFA irrigation and nitrogen management training program credits available, and you'll receive an email about those credits as well after the meeting. Uh, this session will focus on priority nitrate management zones, specifically nitrogen management at the farm scale to reduce, Im to reduce impact on groundwater nitrate. Uh, in this session, we'll discuss how whole farm balances from uh, how whole farm balances inform manure use, how to get the greatest value out of the fertilizer components in manure, as well as utility of automated irrigation systems in forage crops. Um, with that, we will begin the presentation component of this session. Um, I'll include the speaker bios in the chat session, and please remember to use the question and ans answer feature throughout the presentations um, so the speakers can address your questions at the end. So um, right now we will begin with Dr. Deanne Meyer talking, us, talking to us about whole farm balance to identify manure management options. Thank you for coming to the Golden State Dairy Management Conference webinars. I'm Deanne Meyer, the Livestock Waste Management Specialist for UC. Today I'll walk you through important considerations when using whole farm balance to identify manure management options. I'll be sharing work from a variety of projects with input from many collaborators. Christine Miller, Jennifer Hagee, Betsy Carley, Nick Clark, Joy Hollingsworth, Anthony Fulford, Tamara Cohen, David Young, and Peter Robinson were instrumental in some of the work I'm providing, as well as funding from the California Dairy Research Foundation, California Department of Food and Agriculture, and the California Air Resources Board. Today's review of nitrogen calculations will focus on important control points when calculating field-by-field -field balances, as well as whole farm balance. Lastly, the implications of whole farm balance will be discussed as these relate to manure management options. 91% of California dairy cows reside in the Central Valley, with the majority of those in the San Joaquin Valley. Many of these farms are in priority one or priority two nitrate management zones. Part of management zone work will require land operators to modify practices to reduce nitrate concentration in groundwater. For nearly a decade, most Central Valley dairies have participated in the Central Valley Dairy Representative Monitoring Program. This program issued its summary report about two years ago. Key in this report is the use of whole farm balance calculations to identify if and how much manure could we locate off individual facilities. Dairy producers already collect key data at the dairy. These data are used to calculate balances on a field-by-field -field basis. The difference between nutrient inputs 
and outputs equals the balance. These nutrients may build up at the facility or be lost to the environment. Key management recommendations provided in the summary representative monitoring report will be reviewed. Calculating nitrogen balance at the field level requires knowing how much material is applied or removed and its nitrogen content. Great improvements can be achieved with attention to detail. Key measurement areas include solid and liquid manure nutrient applications and nutrient harvested and forages removed from fields. Let's start with nitrogen removal from fields since all fields have a crop. The nitrogen content of forages harvested from fields is calculated by multiplying the mass of forage by its nitrogen content. If only one load per truck is weighed, the estimate of forage harvested is poor. It turns out that the greatest improvement in estimating nitrogen content of forages occurs when every load of forage removed from the field is weighed. This is very useful for those who aren't already weighing all truckloads. How the representative sample of forage is collected is also important. For corn and sorghum, taking three to five samples throughout the harvest of the field provides material for a composite that is within plus or minus 10% of the actual dry matter content. It takes at least 10 grab samples collected throughout the harvest of the field to have a composite within plus or minus 5% of the actual dry matter content. Winter forage is far more variable in its moisture content and requires more grab samples to achieve the same precision. Now we'll focus on liquid manure quantification and sampling. All dairies have liquid manure. The amount of nitrogen collected in the liquid stream will depend on animal housing. We evaluated time on concrete, milking time, and time at the feed bunk or in freestyle burns to estimate the percent of manure collected in the liquid system. We estimated about 70 and 78% of time on concrete for two different facilities. The higher percentage was associated with a 3X milking herd. Our non-freestyle dairies had values of 31 and 37% of time on concrete for lactating cattle. Lactating cattle in freestyle spent more than double the amount of time on concrete and therefore had more manure collected in the liquid stream. One recommendation in the summary representative monitoring report is to use flow meters to precisely estimate quantity of liquid manure applied. This will improve measurement abilities tremendously with a minimum accuracy of plus or minus 2%. Next is sampling. Today, quarterly samples are taken when liquid manure is land applied. There is some lag time between when samples are taken and when data are available for use in calculating an application. Also, numerous management practices from restricting animal use of open lots and freestyle housing to use of animal soakers can modify the amount of manure collected and the dilution of the manure collected. The lab results are combined with flow rates to calculate nutrient applications. In the future, we will likely see use of very frequent and instantaneous measurements to estimate nitrogen concentrations. This will be a proxy measurement for total nitrogen. Analyses will still need to be done to address form of nitrogen and to validate proxy measurements. Solid manure represents more of the nitrogen pool on non-freestyle dairies. For freestyle facilities, this may still represent a good quantity of nitrogen. Solid manure sampling is a little more complex than forage sampling. Here, grab samples need to come from inside and outside of the piles since there are different moisture concentrations in these areas. We sampled many cores within a pile to determine a good sampling protocol. For multi-source piles, 10 grab samples are needed with seven or eight grab samples taken from within the manure pile at depths greater than one and a half feet. This will make a composite that is likely within plus or minus 15%. Let's move from field calculations to whole farm analysis. Animal numbers and productivity can be used to estimate nitrogen excretion. Accounting for reasonable nitrogen losses during collection and storage, there is a base amount of nitrogen that's present for land application. The amount of nitrogen to apply is identified in the irrigation and nitrogen management plan. 
the difference between the amount of manure in the present and the amount of manure nitrogen applied is the amount of manure available for export. Each dairy will evaluate its export needs. Can hauling all solid manure off farm meet needs? That'll depend on the amount of export manure needed. When the amount of nitrogen to export exceeds the amount of nitrogen in solid manure, additional options will be required. Densifying manure nutrients makes it more feasible to export them off farm. Thanks to funding from CDFA, dairy operators have implemented some newer alternative manure management practices. Additional funding from the California Dairy Research Foundation allows us to evaluate different manure management practices to better understand options to densify nutrients and move them off farm. Use of vacuums to collect manure from concrete surfaces relocates manure nutrients from the liquid to the solid handling system. This makes it possible to dry and ultimately ship off farm. Great challenges exist with vacuum manure in both summer and winter. During summer, ample sunshine is available to dry vacuum manure. This material is quite wet with animal cooling soakers or sprinklers running. In the winter, manure is thicker, yet there's insufficient solar radiation for a few months to dry manure. Incorporation of manure into drier solids is beneficial to manage freshly collected vacuum material. This may include use of shells or dried separator or corral solids and the making of compost. A few other approaches are being used. Compost bedded pack barns are increasing in popularity. These eliminate most of liquid manure collection. Manure dropped into the compost bedded pack is incorporated twice daily and occasionally removed from the barn. It's handled as a solid and is prevented from entering the liquid waste stream. Attention to moisture management and regular tilling are essential to keep these barns functioning properly. Another technology in use is a UASB reactor coupled with a moving bed biofilm reactor and algae raceway. The demonstration project on a facility near Hanford was useful to prove the concept. A full-scale system is being installed on a commercial farm. This has potential for nitrogen management. A more detailed analysis of nutrients is in progress. Let's summarize this presentation. Calculating field by field or whole farm balance requires good farm specific information. Precise measurement of the amount of material applied to or removed from fields is important. Next, samples of materials need to be truly representative of the source to closely calculate nitrogen management. And lastly, if your dairy is plush with manure, do your homework before investing in a manure treatment technology. They are not all equal and may or may not fit your actual facility needs. So feel free to drop me an email if you have any questions related to all things manure. Again, thank you for taking time from your day to join us. I look forward to the question and answer period. Introduce the next speaker. Um, so our next speaker is Nick Clark, and he'll be speaking with us on fertilizing crops with dairy manure. Hello, I'm Nick Clark, the Agronomy and Nutrient Management Farm Advisor for the University of California Cooperative Extension, serving King, Tulare, and Fresno counties. Today I'm going to be discussing how to fertilize forage crops with manure talk about some of the, the basic challenges of such a practice and just big picture uh, guidelines for how we might do it well now and in the future. Fertilizing forage crops with manure is no easy task and there are definitely some major challenges associated with the practice. For one, manure is heterogeneous with regard to the nutrient content both in time and in space and also on a single dairy and in between dairies. It's also very difficult to get an accurate measurement of uh, manure nutrient content in a quick enough time span to make a, a decision about fertilizer application. Oftentimes a lab analysis comes back too late uh, and application has already been made. 
Also timing manure nitrogen applications with uh, crop demand is difficult because a large portion of nitrogen in manure is in the organic form and has to be converted to a mineral form or plant available form by soil microbes uh, before it can be counted uh, toward uh, the crop's need. And that of course happens at different rates based on environmental conditions. Finally, because manure is one of those you get what you get products, uh, there's often an, an imbalance of some of the nutrients found in manure uh, applied and what a particular crop needs. Oftentimes when fertilizing corn, for example, with uh, liquid dairy manure, we tend to see an accumulation of phosphorus and potassium in the soils because much more is applied in the manure uh, liquid manure fraction than the corn crop can possibly take up. So first I'm going to discuss the heterogeneity of manure as a fertilizer. And I'm going to give some examples of the variation of nutrient contents, both within a single lagoon on one dairy and also um, in lagoons between uh, multiple dairies. This slide is a demonstration of variation of total nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, uh, both within and between nine dairy lagoons from uh, adapted from a publication by Pettigrove, uh, Henrik, and Eagle back in 2009. The blue bars on each graph represent the high, the median, and the low values found within each pond and the numbers on the bottom represent the different dairies from which the samples were taken. So in other words, if you have a very tall uh, bar along the y-axis, that signifies a lot of variation of a, a nutrient within a pond. And then when you look at these middle bars, or the middle lines within each bar, that's representing the median value. So when they go up and down like that for any of these graphs, it's representing a lot of variation in between ponds you can see that there's no real rhyme or reason um, for uh, nutrient concentration between dairies and we cannot apply a one-size-fits-all uh, to the concentration of nutrients in dairy manure. Now I'm going to discuss measuring manure nutrients and the frequency of making those measurements and how that data might apply to making application decisions. Decisions to apply manure nutrients to crops based on data are often being um, made based on data that happened uh, previous to the application. So there, in this example, you can see there is a sample taken from the pond um, early in time and the concentration analysis of those uh, of that sample is being used in order to estimate the application with each irrigation blended with processed wastewater throughout the season. So you can see that as you get later and later into the season, those arrows pointing all the way back to that earlier pond sample are farther and farther away from uh, the time when that analysis was conducted. And what we know about the heterogeneity of manure means that um, the accuracy of that estimate um, is poorer and poorer as, as time goes on. The extreme opposite of that previous example where one data point is meant to inform many subsequent applications of manure nutrients is of course constant real-time measurement of manure nutrients. Uh, in this example there's a, a crude diagram of a system uh, that was uh, designed and demonstrated in research by Sustainable Conservation uh, where an electrical conductivity meter was fitted in line um, on a lagoon uh, manure injection port into an irrigation main line and the electrical conductivity measurements serve as a proxy measurement for uh, nitrogen content and th that data gets fed back into a computer controlling a valve that adjusts the rate of uh, lagoon water into being injected into the system in order to achieve a target application rate. The next topic is the timing of application of manure nutrients relative to crop demand um, and some considerations that need to be taken in order to do so well. This slide demonstrates the importance of matching 
uh, nitrogen applications with crop demand over time, the example being with corn. You can see in the graph on the left, a uh, typical corn nitrogen uptake curve where very early on in the season, there's low accumulation of nitrogen and then very rapidly uh, at an early stage, the rate of uptake uh, increases and then becomes linear for a while and eventually slows down as we get closer to harvesting the crop. So there's variability in the rate of nitrogen uptake over the season. It should be clear then that when we apply the crop's total demand of nitrogen at the beginning of the season, um, for quite a while during crop growth, there's um, a lot of opportunity for that nitrogen in the field to be lost uh, to the environment through various pathways. Alternatively, when smaller amounts are applied over time, just prior to when the crop needs it, there's much less opportunity for that nitrogen to be lost to the environment simply because it's not present in the field. Of course, that's a lot easier said than done because the, a lot of the nitrogen and manure has to be converted to a plant available form before it's useful to the plant. This table shows several examples of the mineralization rate of nitrogen in different manure sources over time, where you can see that for dairy lagoon water, about half of the organic nitrogen will be mineralized within the first year. And then all the way down at the bottom, dairy mechanical screen solids, only about 10 to 20% of the nitrogen will be mineralized in the first year. And then for all of the sources, um, only a fraction of that application will be mineralized in the second year. Um, take note of the, the uh, text at the bottom of the table pointing out, however, that somewhere between half and three quarters of all of that mineralization will, will occur just in the first uh, month to eight weeks following the application. So there's, there's quite a bit of a moving target there in terms of the time of the availability of that nitrogen for the crop, making spoon feeding um, a crop with manure nitrogen um, fairly difficult. We'll talk about some of the challenges associated with the nutrient balance of manure versus the crops to which we apply it. In this slide, I show you the fertilizer equivalency ratios normalized to the P205 content for both the nutrient content of uh, liquid manure and the NPK removed in a corn crop. You can see that if we were to try and meet crop uh, nitrogen demand by applying liquid manure, we would very uh, quickly start to overaccumulate K2O in the field. Certainly then if we were to slightly over fertilize with uh, liquid manure trying to meet the corn nitrogen demand, we would also start to accumulate phosphorus in the field. This is a similar slide, only the table on the right is showing the ratios for alfalfa removal. And you can see that if you were to try and meet the alfalfa nitrogen demand with uh, liquid manure, uh, you would very rapidly accumulate phosphorus and potassium. But since alfalfa can fix its own nitrogen, it means you don't have to necessarily apply uh, any manure to alfalfa, and that means that it's probably a good rotation partner with corn and small grains, especially if there's an accumulation of potassium and phosphorus in those soils because of alfalfa's high demand for uh, those elements. So at the end of the day, uh, what we can be certain of is that manure is heterogeneous. It's uneven both uh, a across time and space, and it's very difficult to measure in time for making crop fertilization decisions. Uh, but if we have more accurate manure nutrient content information, um, we can certainly do a lot better at meeting crop demand uh, by fertilizing uh, with manure, albeit it is less precise than using guaranteed analysis uh, synthetic fertilizers. And then finally, we should consider uh, fertilizing our forages on a P or K uh, crop need basis when using dairy manure, and we can uh, possibly eliminate some of that initial over fertilization with nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. Thank you for listening, and I'd be uh, happy to discuss further with any of you. Thank you. Okay, uh, folks, just a reminder, don't forget to use the question and answer function 
um, within Zoom to get your, your questions posed to our speakers. We have one last presentation in this, uh, this session. Um, Dr. Khaled Bali will be talking to us about irrigation management automation. Hello and good afternoon. Welcome to the California Golden State Dairy Management Webinar. And today I'll be talking about automation of surface irrigation systems. My name is uh, Khaled Bali. I'm irrigation water management specialist with the University of California based at the UC Penn Max Center in earlier California. So when we take a look at the irrigation systems in California for, for field crops, uh, we find that we have mostly surface irrigation systems or flood irrigation. And typically we have uh, two common types, border or uh, strip or flat irrigation and furrow irrigations, furrow irrigation. We have some basin irrigation. We also have very little uh, sprinkler irrigation on field crop and very limited subsurface drip irrigation on field crops such as alfalfa. Uh, when we take a look at uh, the irrigation systems in California over the years back in the 70s, uh, gravity or flood irrigation used to be the dominant form of irrigation system. We used to have about 80%. Now we're down to about 30% of flood irrigation system. In the meantime, we can see a huge increase in the drip irrigation, especially when we deal with the tree crops and uh, vegetables. Now, if we take a look at the percentage of field crops, back in the 70s, we used to have about 70% of irrigated farms in California with uh, field crops. Now we're down to about 30%. And you can see a huge decline over the last 10 to 12 years in uh, the number of acres of field crops. So when we talk about uh, flood irrigation, Typical flood irrigation system like this one in, in the picture here in the Sacramento Valley. We typically have lower efficiency, higher labor cost, and inability to control flow rate. So we get the flow rate, a given flow rate, it's typically fixed for the duration of the irrigation. Very little flexibility on the irrigation time, it's typically fixed. Now, when we start talking about automation, this is an example of automated gate on alfalfa field in the uh, blue desert of California. This is what kind of automation we can do on the field. This is the on-farm automation. We, in addition to automation, we need a flexible delivery system so we can adjust the flow, flow rate and adjust the irrigation time. Or basically having uh, on demand so we can increase efficiency and utilize the water that we have to the maximum. This is an example of modern irrigation districts in the San Joaquin Valley where you have control. The grower can decide how much water they want to order and the duration. And if they need to adjust the flow rate during the irrigation event, they can do it as well without too much of a hassle. So when we talk about uh, irrigation automation, with the flood irrigation, irrigators or growers typically work in long hours, anywhere from 12 to 24 hour shifts. They make decisions on when to turn the water off based on a number of factors. From their experience, they can look at the flow rate, how fast the water is moving across the field, and the crop characteristics, whether you have a high crop or short crop, and then they make a decision based on their experience. With the automation, we basically take a look at these variables, and instead of making a guess or rely on experience, we can rely on actual real-time data related to flow rate, advanced rate, and we can use automated gates to turn uh, uh, water on and off or reduce the flow rate, flow rate or increase the flow rate. One of the biggest uh, advantages of automation is water conservation, but also, as you know, lately we're dealing with uh, higher labor costs with a $15 per hour 
uh, as a minimum wage plus 40% overhead in, uh, in overhead for uh, the irrigation labor. You could see here several types of automated gates that we tried over the last 10 years or so. This is one of the automated gates that we have uh, in, on an alpha alpha field in the low desert of California. You could see the gate here. We can control uh, when to turn the water on, when to turn it off, and if we have to cut back on the flow rate. The automation involved also automating the delivery ditch in the farm. And we could also have uh, advanced sensors, soil moisture sensors, to, to help us making decisions during the irrigation event. This is another example of automated gate on furrow irrigation. Here we're looking at using automated uh, uh, gates to irrigate sugar beets down in the imperial valley. And I wanna look at the two common parameters that are typically used to uh, evaluate irrigation uh, efficiency. One of them is application efficiency and the other one is distribution uniformity. And for example, you know, in this case, we could uh, set the irrigation time to vary anywhere from four to five hours. And let's look at different scenarios during the irrigation event. Once we know what's going on with automation because of the sensors, we can determine, well, if we run the system for four hours, we're gonna have really high application efficiency, but uh, definitely low distribution uniformity. And if our target, this is looking at the field, this is a quarter of a mile run. So this is the beginning of the field, this is the end of the field. And our goal is to have about four inches of water going into the ground. Well, as you can see here, this is the depth of infiltration. We're getting the four inches for about most of the field. The minute we start looking at the second half of the field, we have under irrigation. So this is why we have higher efficiency, but we ended up with under irrigation. Let's look at another scenario during the irrigation event and say, okay, we wanna increase the irrigation time to five hours. This will give us much better application efficiency, about 84% and a great distribution uniformity. And keep in mind, these numbers are as good as uh, most of the pressurized irrigation system. You could see here in this example, we have really, this is the depth required four inches, and we really have good application going on into most of the field and a little bit of under irrigation, which does not impact this crop because this is a germination irrigation and we don't worry about, you know, getting the four inches. So in this example, you could see we can uh, optimize the flow rate and the irrigation time to get the maximum efficiency. Now with automation, we have the option to, to do lots of things. One of them is to cut back on the flow rate. Here in this example, I have a five hour irrigation event and then I decide well toward the end of the irrigation event, I'm gonna cut the flow rate a little bit. As you can see here, you know, cutting the flow rate has actually saved more water and kept the high application efficiency and distribution uniformity. This is the end result from the yield uh, from last year. We got three cuttings of uh, sugar beets. And this is the typical one. We got about 50 tons, which, uh, which is an indication that, you know, uh, automation uh, did not have any impact on crop, crop yield. And in fact, we ended up with about 75% of uh, labor saving. To summarize, you know, I think the key factor for automation is uh, the higher labor costs. We could reduce irrigation labor hours by about 75% or even more with automation. We need with automation, with on-farm automation, we need also to look at automating the delivery to the farm. So we need uh, to have more control like on demand or demand response or active control where the grower can decide on cutting the irrigation time or changing the flow rate. We can use the existing surface irrigation as locations where we can do groundwater recharge and bank that water. 
Surface irrigation is also good for the environment. There is a lot less energy associated with surface irrigation, especially if you're getting the water from surface uh, sources. There is no energy cost at all. And there is also the associated cost of you know, reducing uh, uh, greenhouse gas emission, as well as uh, benefits to the environment. Uh, with this, I conclude my talk, and you could see here lots of birds with, uh, with the flood irrigation systems. Thank you so much for uh, listening to, talk, to my talk. Okay, thank you to all of our speakers. I think what I miss most about being in person is the clapping. So big claps for everyone. Um, I'm gonna invite, oh, all my speakers are, are live in their videos, thank you. So um, we'll move on to question and answers. I'm gonna start, we have one question um, that's publicly and then I had a bunch sent to me. So um, we'll start with the public question and answer um, section. Um, this is for Nick. Nick, is there any known or possible pathogenic effect of manure application on any crop plants in the region? Uh, I'm going to assume the question is about uh, pathogenic effects on uh, on the crops, so plant pathogens. Um, I'm I'm not personally aware of any direct uh, pathogenic effects um, of applying manure to crops, although there are some uh, uh, indirect um, associations uh, with uh, 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 manure application and and crop disease. So in in uh, some scenarios where, for instance, uh, a fertilizing with manure can introduce an undesirable amount of weeds um, that are poorly managed weeds uh, in a crop field can be host for um, either uh, certain uh, insect pest vectors of viral diseases um, or, or provide continuous uh, root matter for certain soil-borne uh, root pathogens um, or nematodes that negatively affect crops. Um, in other instances, uh, applying uh, uh, maybe too much uh, solid manure over the surface of uh, alfalfa, for instance, during the dormant season might create some uh, microclimates uh, during the plant regrowth phase um, that, are, that are favorable for some uh, fungal pathogens that can attack the uh, plant. But I'm not aware of any direct pathogenic effects of applying manure to, um, to uh, forage crops. All right, thank you, Nick. Okay, next we'll go to um, Khaled. Um, what is the average cost of automating a typical 80 or 160 acre fields? Uh, you'll be looking at anywhere uh, from about 800 to $1,000 an acre uh, for, for an 80 acre uh, field. The uh, bigger the field is, or if you have multiple fields, the cost will go down because you can utilize multiple systems, uh, you know, to, to reduce the cost down. Okay, thank you. All right, moving to Deanne. Uh, Deanne, will workshops be available to help producers through the whole farm balance process? Yeah, we anticipate that the Dairy Quality Assurance Program and the Central Valley Dairy Representative Monitoring Program will work collaboratively to identify a series of outreach workshops for producers as we get further into the um, Priority 1 Nitrate Management Zone facilities and the Priority 2 Nitrate Management Zone facilities. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's, let's go back to Nick. Um, what information is needed to improve fertilization precision with manure? Well, um, I think uh, we, we need to know how uh, to uh, feasibly uh, collect more uh, accurate information about the, the nutrient contents of manure closer to the time that it's being applied. Um, certainly, it doesn't make sense given, uh, you know, current uh, practices and availability of, uh, of labor and the, and the methods that we uh, use, the laboratory methods we use to measure the neuronutrients to, you know, take a sample at every irrigation, uh, because that would not be informative um, enough to adjust the application rate of manure at the time. 
Um, so probably some more work into um, the, the automation of uh, manure uh, 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 nutrient constituent measurement that's uh, real time close to what uh, has been demonstrated in California using electrical conductivity would, uh, would certainly be helpful moving forward. Um, and uh, there's, there's a huge gap in knowledge about uh, the, the factors uh, that control um, the, the availability or the mineralization of organic nitrogen um, in the various contents of manure that are typically applied to uh, forage fields in, in California. That's, um, you know, that, that requires, that will require a lot of work going forward if, if that's, uh, you know, something that uh, we want to know. All right. Thank you, Nick. Um, back to you, Khaled. Uh, what are the necessary changes in farm personnel training to operate and maintain an automated surface irrigation system? Uh, it's a completely different environment. So uh, whoever does the irrigation, they need to get uh, trained on the automated systems, how to run it. It's relatively simple. It could be done through a phone, a smartphone, or uh, through a computer. Uh, you can turn, you can do complete automation where you can make decisions based on given advanced time, like you know, like when the water reaches, for example, two thirds of the field, or you could, uh, or you could do, uh, uh, you know, uh, given irrigation time, like four hours per set, and uh, you know, if you want to adjust it, you can adjust it easily. So there are different levels, but it's not too difficult. Okay, thank you. Before I, I move back to Deanne, I want to remind folks that the poll question is up. So if you wouldn't mind, um, if you're still with us, please go ahead and answer. Um, we'll have two poll questions. So I think the first is up. Um, and um, we'll just keep going while that's going. Um, so Deanne, um, how do you know how many samples to take for solid manure regulatory requirements? Or I guess how many? So it's going to depend. Um, depend on whether it's uh, a similar kind of material in the pile or whether it's mixed material in the pile. Um, and we've actually just completed a document with UC through the peer review process on um, sampling solid manure. So we'll have that available hopefully soon. Um, but the more um, non-homogeneous the pile is, the more samples we have to take. And what's really important is that you take at least 10 um, for those homogeneous piles and that the bulk of the samples, seven or eight of them, the grab samples come from the inside of the pile because the moisture is so different inside and outside. Uh, and then you mix all of them together and take a composite out of that. And that's what we use for um, sending off to the laboratory. All right, so just so we have a few more minutes. So folks, if you do have questions, please feel free to put them in the, the question and answer um, portion. I, I'll have, I have some more I can ask, but, um, or if you're shy, you can send them to me directly and I'll ask them for you and I, I won't tell them who's asking. So um, that's also an option. So let's go, let's see, I'm just scrolling through. Khaled, um, could the data collection part of the system be used to keep records on water and manure uh, applications more accurately? Oh yeah, definitely. Because as part of the automation, you're measuring flow rate all the time and you have a complete record of uh, when you turn the gate on and off and uh, you know total water applied or depth of, uh, uh, of irrigation. And if you're applying manure, you could do the same thing. It's relatively easy. Okay, thank you. Let's see, I know I have more here. Okay, and uh, Khaled, you're you're quite popular in my in my chat section. So, um, are automated irrigation systems integrated with tailwater return or capture systems? Uh, yes, they're very easily uh, integrated into tailwater recovery systems because you can make decisions on whether you want to have uh, you know, uh, some runoff. If you have a tailwater recovery system, actually it makes life much easier because you have a lot more control and you take that water and recapture it and reuse it again. 
So that will give you uh, flexibility. Okay, and don't mute just yet. I've got one more question for you. Um, is there potential for automating dairy process wastewater injection into automated irrigation sets to hit target nutrient application rates? This is a great question. And we just got the project uh, funded with uh, Nick and Diane to, uh, to look at this, uh, uh, at using automation for uh, you know, nutrient management with the uh, lagoon water. Okay. So I'm, I'm still scrolling through questions. Is there anything, so here's, is there anything our speakers, we've got a couple minutes left, any parting thoughts? Uh, you know, uh, something that you missed that you, you'd like to have folks leave with today? Um, sure, I'll say a couple things about the solid manure story and application of nutrients to land. Being able to have a good handle on the nutrient content is part of the equation. And so sampling um, cow manure from heifer manure from other manure that depending on what the diets are and the animals and the volume and material is really important to separate those out. Equally important in all of that is actually weighing the manure as it's land applied to know how much went where so you can apply the laboratory results to the weight of the material applied. Taking a wild stab at those numbers, not so good. Great, thank you. Nick or Colette, anything you'd like to add before we go? Well, just one more thing about uh, flood irrigation. Flood irrigation, actually, it's a good system and it could be as efficient as drip or sprinkler irrigation system. And I think the probably the last uh, you know things I'd like to say is um, uh, while uh, we're we're looking at some rather promising uh, technologies in in California um, that can be fairly easily integrated into uh, dairy forage crop uh, growing. I think it's it, it would be important for us to keep keep an eye open for um, those that are most easily uh, uh, adopted in our uh, in our normal management practices. Um, I think it's it's really cool when we when we you know see um, some systems that are being coupled with uh, uh, you know buried drip uh, irrigation, um, but that's uh, it, it's not something that can necessarily be applied to all uh, systems, and there are certainly some large um, opportunity costs, but there are components of uh, of that. A system, for instance, uh, particularly, you know, using electrical conductivity as a proxy for measuring uh, nitrogen in the system, which can very likely be easily integrated with a system that Khaled, for instance, was talking about and bringing in what you know Dan was mentioning about, uh, you know, being more precise with uh, uh, and and frequent with, uh, you know, collecting me uh, measurements that are more representative. I, I think we are moving in a positive direction. Um, there's a lot of opportunity that's really easy to grab for us in California. Okay, awesome. Well, thank you to, to our three speakers in session four. Um, at this time, I'd like to thank everyone for attending our first UC Golden State Dairy Management webinar. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the format and uh, that you are walking away with a take-home message or two um, please feel free to reach out if you have any comments, suggestions, questions. Uh, you can find the program contacts as well as all the speaker contact information uh, on the same website that you uh, where you registered. Uh, so on behalf of the organizing committee, uh, I'd like to thank you for your time today. And we hope to see everyone in person next year at the 2022 Golden State Dairy Management Conference. Um, and until then, take care and we will see you soon.